We ready? Okay, I would like to, oh, hi, Tony. Nice to see you. You look young. <laughs> would like to call this meeting back to order uh, and do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. And Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cardinal. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, so we are uh, in a phase question, uh, asking questions to administration. And uh, I think we left there yesterday and we'll carry on with the list. And Councillor Wright, you are next in the line. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got some questions about some of the unfunded service packages. Um, the ex expanded snow program. This is mainly to supplement the provincial seniors program, is that correct, Ms. Flamin? That's correct. Okay, so how much of it is actually gonna be used for funding to actually clear snow? <clears throat> the funding to actually clear the snow would be done through the contracts run by the GOA. This would be administrative, but I will uh, see if Keith Scott or David Jones would like to provide more details. Because my concern is it, it talks about it being for um, to help people with disabilities and, and experiencing mobility issues, but that's not part of the government program, correct? No, that's true. Okay. Mr. Scott or Mr. Jones, somebody? Uh, yeah, just seeing if Keith's online, but uh, you, you're correct that it's not part of the government programming. Uh, the the thought was that we could mirror some of that um, with some grant funding, but I'd have to get back on the exact details on that one. Okay, so I'm just wondering if there's a, a maybe a, a different way to approach this um, to, to provide those people with disabilities and, and those experience mobility issues um, to help them not only get their snow cleared, but the, the rest of the pathway to the bus stop or the, to, the, to the LRT. Is there something in, um, in operations communications plan? So we were provided more funding this year in the program to look at um, uh, active pathways. So this winter, uh, we're up to levels that we had last winter. So it should help with the active pathway connections. Okay, and, but any, any communications? I know in the past we've done um, like Snow Angels program and I know that was kind of phased out, but is there, is there any way to maybe bring back more awareness to the public about helping their neighbor? We are uh, in the process of doing that. So Calgary has a volunteer recognition program that costs nothing. And we are looking to mirror that. We'll have that on our website. It doesn't require any direction from council. It's just a nice neighborly thing to do. And we have a little certificate that you can download and fill out and give to your neighbor in appreciation. Yeah, I think that, that's a wonderful way to, to go about it. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of very helpful Edmontonians out there who will be willing to help their neighbours. Thank you very much. Um, so then my next question is around, oh, this isn't unfunded, but it's the Community Investment Operating Grant. Um, and again, Ms. Flamin, I guess, um, I, don't, I think it's too early to, to sort of assess any of the outcomes from the, the revised funding parameters that when, when the when we reinstated 25% of the CIOG. Is Judy Smith on the call to be able to give any um, insights on that? She might not be joining with us. We did send a memo in the spring talking about the changes that we did make. Um, and I can circle back to see if there are any results. I, I suspect it is fully subscribed because it was a drop in, in actual dollars that were available to a community that was interested. Okay, and then those that used to receive the funding, because um, I think the parameters were um, less than 500,000 in, in revenues, 
So, so those larger organizations, what, what recourse do they have for funding to help with their operations? Would that be like the FCSS funding? No, the FCSS funding is a different, um, seeks different outcomes than what the CIOG is designed to do. Okay, so there's no other alternative for those larger organizations. When it comes to capital, there are provincial funding uh, sources that they can look at, but from a city perspective, um, I don't think that there is anything like that. Okay, thank you. And in my few seconds left, I'm gonna go back to the unfunded service package for tree maintenance. How are we able to maintain the trees that um, the federal government has provided for funding? I'll throw that to Craig if you can answer that. Yeah, so in, in, the, um, in the federal grant for the first three years to establish the new trees that are being grown, um, that's incorporated within the capital, uh, the capital package so within the grant funding for that first three years. Uh, however, after that runs out, um, our operating budget would have to grow uh, proportional to um, the amount of trees being added. So that, that is something to expect in a, uh, a, a future, um, so it'll be the 2027 budget and onwards is where that, that operating funding will need to be um, added. Okay, I'll come back for a second round for follow-up. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So I want to go focus on the adjustment proposed by city administration and to have better understanding for the $100 million more expenditures proposed in the operating budget. Um, compared to the last years, uh, we approved operating budget. Uh, I'm going in line by line by this one. Um, the first one is about, about because adjustment and refracting the five categories. The first category, I would like to see that changes to eco economic forecasts. Um, we have like $26 million and for the investment earns and also we budget expen expen expenditures for the same amount. Can you provide a breakdown for these expenditures? The expenses actually, this is the transfer to the capital budget for pay as you go. So on the operating side, we have $26 million more, $26.8 million more in investment earnings. We simply transfer all $26.8 million to the capital budget. And then it goes into the corporate funding pool We've made certain allocations out of that, which you see in the capital budget, and there is $12.4 million left unallocated in pay as you go. Um, so that means this $26.8 million will be used for the capital adjustment. That's so, correct. And then for which profile, which capital profile? And then is this one is must used? or is just additional? And I just want to make sure this is necessary use. So our practice and our the way we have always built our budgets is investment earnings because of their volatility go to capital. Once they're on the capital side, council can choose whether they would like to allocate that to a capital project or hold it. So right now we're in hold it, so we're not allocated. Uh, no, you've allocated portions of it. Sorry, I'm just trying to make my way to the uh, relevant section of the capital budget. Uh, I would like to know the information about it is in hold or it is already allocated specific capital profile. So this is uh, my first question when you are doing this. I'm going to my next question. My next so maybe I'll just, page five of the capital budget yes. shows um, the corporate funding pool and it'll show the amount going in and then all of the allocations made against it. And for how many, how many capital files will we use this? $26 million? So the $26 million goes into the corporate funding yep. pool. It yep. forms part of the balance, and that is used to fund a number of projects, but more projects than just that, because there's more than just the 26.8 million. But I, I, do need the, I do need the list for this money to be used and to see it's the necessary expenses or it's 
is just for holding. So I, I can follow up to get the detail on this piece first. That's his $26 million for that number one. Yeah. So the next one, the next question is going to the utility adjustment across multi, multiple branches. And specific for this one is $12, $12 million. And about this $12 million, I would like to know what specific utility adjustment. And because right now we are, this is my basic principle why I'm asking this question, because we are planning, we are budgeting compared to last year, 100 more million dollars for expenditures. I would like to know for those planning expenditures and is there every each item and it is must used. So next question is about utility adjustment. Okay, so the utility adjustments yeah. are the increase in utility, the expected increase in utilities from the new contract, utility contracts entered by the city for 2024 and beyond. We estimate what that is. We have we hold central contracts and then we allocate out the budget to the branches depending on which facility they operate. So that's his all for, for the city's uh, facilities. It's all, yeah, it's all for, it's across all the branches across the city. Across the entire yeah. city. Right. And then, so this is the increase compared to the 2023 compared to Last year, the increase twelve million dollars, the, and then for two thousand twenty-four, it's the it's the increase uh, compared to the original twenty twenty-four approved budget. The increase for to also compared to the budget we approved the last year. Correct. Yeah, so that's his increase, and we budget more increase and twelve million dollars for two thousand twenty-four. Okay. Councilor Rice, a little bit more information. The majority of it, like eight eight point four million, is related to power. There's natural gas is 1.4, and then water, sewer, and drainage is about 2.2. So it's a combination of all of the different types of utilities throughout the organization. So power is by far driving the biggest increase. Okay. Okay, so the next line is about taxation appeals. For I'm Jackson. so sorry, Councillor Rice. Oh, my time is out. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't yeah. notice. Yeah. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have some questions. I guess the first one would be uh, around turf and the sequencing of turf. I know there's no unfunded service packages in this budget related to turf because we haven't had the presentation yet on our turf that would then likely lead to a motion to have an unfunded service package. So I, I have a, two things like one, is at a high level, what are we looking at next year around our turf maintenance with our, with our current budget as proposed today? And two, what would be the process sequencing if can I just make an amendment to add a certain amount to turf? So I can answer what would it look like. Uh, the, the, the turf maintenance that we had this summer will be the same turf maintenance we have next summer. Uh, but there's a, there's, we're not meeting our own standards right now, right? That's correct. So what is it going to take to get us to our standards? I'll turn that over to Craig. Yeah, so um, like, like Eddie mentioned, uh, we, are not, we are not achieving our service levels as of, as of today. Um, we have a report that's coming together. Uh, it's currently going to be delivered uh, in in January, mm. um, but but right now, uh, in order to achieve uh, both like trim and and turf, uh, it would be in the in the ballpark of uh, about three point eight million dollars to achieve our service levels as of today. So that would be covering uh, sports fields, uh, fields and schools, uh, and and achieving trim. Okay. Uh, twice a year and the trim cycle on its own is 411,000 right to get it to the that, two that's correct yeah so specific just to trimming we're uh, we're not achieving our service levels of twice a year uh, it would be about 400,000 to achieve that just at two 
Okay. Thank you for that information. And then just a guess to the clerk or to Stacy. Is there a sequencing issue, like, or, or Andre even, like, should, if this is coming in January, but we know there's a deficit now, is it better to make amendments now to the budget, or should we wait? Because spring would, SPOVA would be cutting it pretty short for actual, like, service delivery planning. Yeah, I'd say it's if, if we don't make the decision and we try to adjust the budget in January, February, it's going to be very hard, hard to do that. So okay, the thank problem you. is we don't have the full details of the report. I, I know. Uh, and I think part of the report. But we, do, we don't have the full details of the report, but we do yeah. know that we're not meeting our current standards and that some money, is, that no money is not going to help the situation. Yeah, correct. But I also think there could potentially be a discussion about the standards themselves, right? Okay, so that's fair. So it's fair to say we're not meeting our standards, but the, I guess think another question to ask is. Well, I, is, I, yeah. yes, I have my opinions of that. Well, definitely. From my ward, I think trim cycles, if we were to go any lower, we'd have a riot on our hands personally, but like, so. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, transit. I wanna switch over to transit for the last minute and a half for this. Um, so there's a few potentials with the Valley Line redistribution as well as the temporary transit garage. What I'm not seeing is the line of sight of like, okay, if those were to be passed, where, what would transit in ETS do in terms of actually allocating those within the system? Uh, I'll, I'll maybe take a stab at that and I'll turn it over to Kerry after. But I think the, the service right now is about 260,000 hours of funded service that we need to kind of meet the service standards that we have today. We use those service standards to allocate service. So if council were to give us the Valley Line Southeast service hours, which is about 70,000 hours of service, we would allocate that based on the standards that we apply to the service itself. Uh, and obviously in priority order. But what, what does that mean? So like, so for example, and I'm being a little bit self-serving here for the residents that I represent, uh, is it based on solely demand and growth or is it based on other factors? Like how are we distributing those amongst the network? It, it, it's not based on just demand and growth. It's based on uh, sort of like service lateness, late and lost service occurrences, overloads on, to the, on the demand of the service itself. So it's, it's more than just uh, growth in the city uh, itself. So I'll turn it over to Kara if she wants to add. Uh, it's okay, I'll come back for another round. I have a yeah. few more transit questions. Yeah, Thank I think you. that would require more collaborate, uh, elaboration, right? So yeah, yeah, good. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, before I go to Councillor Stevenson, I would like to welcome some students joining us today from uh, School Bishop Gresjak. Bishop Gresjak, hey, grade six class. Uh, what does Winnie Walk counselor? Prince Bay is your counselor. And, and they are here with their teacher, Mrs. C. Horner. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you having fun? Yes, let's give them a big clap. Are you here for the day or uh, longer? One day? Half a day. Oh. Sometimes we wish we were here for half a day, right? <laughs> uh, and are you going to, what are your plans for the half a day? Are you doing any council mock council meetings? What are you talking about? Should the LRT be free? Oh, I think. Uh, did you see a big smile on, on, look at the screen and see a big smile on Councillor Paquette's face. <laughs> He's a big proponent of making transit free for everyone. Uh, good. Uh, okay, so uh, are, you, have you, are you going to have that discussion today, right? Well, let us know what the results be, okay? Who is the mayor? Have you decided yet? You are. What's your name? Oh, Francesca. Well, good luck with deliberations today, everyone. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're talking about budget, which is how are we going to allocate the taxes that we collect from, uh, from households in the city and businesses and how we use those resources to provide services that Edmontonians use, such as roadway systems, public transit, 
spring cleanup, snow removal, police service, fire service, recreational facilities, libraries. There's tons of other services that city provides, uh, provides with all those resources, yeah. Just an education part, the tax levy per, per household, per day, average household, is $8.74. So with $8.74, you get 76 services that make your life better in our city. <laughs> so repeat that to your parents when you go home. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining us. All right, now next we are gonna to go to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. I think um, just a few last questions. Back to the core encampment response. So I understood there were 29 peace officers uh, that that would help fund. Are we looking at, I know typically when we bring on new peace officers, there's a bit of a lag in, in the hiring and bringing those resources online. What sort of timeline do we have um, on this? Uh, David, if you can respond, please. Uh, you bet. So we wouldn't have, um, we would have some lag, uh, but knowing that we've already gone uh, to kind of an overstrength position this year to support the encampment piece. Uh, we know that at least we have a core team in place and uh, we're actually shifting some resources to support that uh, through the winter. Uh, so the, the hope is that we could continue fairly seamlessly into uh, that new cohort. Okay, so a lot of this is sort of more, more backfilling other, other areas where resources have been moved into these functions? Uh, well, no, we, we do have a, a, an overstrength team this year. Uh, so ones without a home position uh, that we'd be looking to put into that as a, as a full-time piece. Uh, and then, yes, there would be some either being able to return folks to their home positions or backfilling in those home positions. Okay. Um, and then just in terms of a, an exit strategy, I mean, I think it's, it's all of our hopes that uh, some longer term solutions come into place in the years ahead. So what, where could those peace officers potentially in the future be, be redistributed to? Well, I think, um, you know, we, we have somewhere between five and 10% attrition uh, every year, we know that. And so I think some of that would be uh, how we could have a natural sort of fill into other roles as peace officers with the city. But, uh, you know, you, you name it is, is where we could uh, put those folks once, you know, very happy if, if we're able to carve down the number of complaints that we're getting in that and, and come up with those long-term solutions. I'm very happy to kind of replace those folks into other roles in the city that they, uh, that they do every day. Great. I would add, Councillor, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the River Valley, so. Yeah. Well, so just, just on that, you know, we've, we've had some previous conversations about, um, my understanding is that a lot of this role is being able to do the risk assessment in a, in a more timely manner. I know we've spoken in the past about potentially other partners or agencies supporting in that work. Um, so just not only from a community building perspective, but from a cost saving measure, is that something that we have explored? Are any other agencies uh, trained and able to do the risk uh, matrix assessment? When we have reached out to different court, like outreach and social serving agencies, there's been a reluctance to be um, uh, performing that function because it can be a bit um, fraught and a lot of that outreach and social serving agencies, uh, their focus is, is more on those support side. Mm -hmm. So it has been explored, but what we have done is that when we do um, an, uh, an assessment and then do a notification and when we have our cleaning schedule in hand, we do communicate uh, with the different social serving agencies so that there is support uh, when cleanup does happen. So that's more the side with the collaboration that's more effective in this moment. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll reflect on that a bit further, but I appreciate the, the work that has been done to reach out to those groups. Um, I think thinking through sort of the decision-making process uh, is an interesting one, but appreciate the tensions you've highlighted. Maybe just lastly, um, on page 104 of attachment two, um, there's an updated fee schedule. Just wondering the logic, uh, it seems that all of the fees are being increased for one year only. I was just curious about the logic there um, in terms of increasing them and then and then decreasing them in later years. Uh, and that's the corporate and financial services fees. 
the ones associated with investment earnings? Sorry. Uh, nope, this is, this is like um, property tax certificates, new certificates, things like that. So uh, virtually all of them increase by a marginal amount in... So oh, is, sorry, I know which ones you're talking about. Okay. Um, so they, you, those are the ones associated with the bylaw that you approved in September. So I believe what the team does, and they can correct me if I'm wrong if they're online, is every year we analyze the fees, we compare it to the f similar fees in other municipalities, look at the average and adjust our fees accordingly. But why would we increase them for one year and then decrease them in subsequent years? So the fee increases really just for the year, then we do the whole process again. So there wasn't, um, I'll maybe ask if. It's okay, I'll come around, because, uh, uh, yeah, thank yep. you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Cardinal. Thank you, good morning. Uh, so a few sort of random questions. Uh, I just want to go back to the uh, satellite garage thing again. Um, I heard yesterday 40 diesel buses uh, for $31 million, $31.5 million. Does that include the shelter as well or the, the garage as well? I'll let Carrie clarify that for you. Uh, good morning. Looking at the numbers, um, so we have it costed in different increments. So for 40 buses, the capital cost, if they were diesel, is $31.6 million. And then to operate the 40 uh, at the high end in, I'm just looking at 2025, uh, it would be $10.8 million uh, for the service hour cost. 10.8 million for the service hour, but 31.5, that's the capital cost required for the buses and for the shelter, for the garage? So the garage itself is an operating lease, uh, so that actually gets okay. factored into the operating impact. Um, it's it's roughly a, just a little over a million dollars uh, per annum for the operating lease. So the capital cost is just for the diesel buses themselves. Ballpark is about 780000 per bus. Okay. Okay, then I have a couple of questions then about Ambleside Yard. So I think that's the only bigger standalone capital project we have that hasn't started yet, or at least hasn't started construction yet. Is that correct? Correct. We've, we've uh, entered into the design process. And what's the capital cost of that project? Just uh, bear with me. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering what the capital cost is and then Mr. Lachlan, if, if that project was delayed, if, you, if there's any line of sight about um, the increase to the budget that would happen because of a delay, cost of construction escalation versus uh, some short-term savings. Well, it's, it's hard to predict escalation these days in the construction industry. Uh, yeah. You know, pre-pandemic, we were at 2.5% per year. And we've seen ranges from 2.5% to as high as 10%, depending on the commodity that we're, we're requiring. So um, hard to pick down. So it, yeah. it's really hard to pick. But I would say the trend is significant in terms of escalation costs for delay. I think if, if there's a notion of delay to find material savings, I would say that that's not factual. Uh, the only opportunity for savings would be to cancel a project. And what's the cost? What's the capital? Uh, sorry, I'm that's just okay. I'll let uh, you can maybe dig that out. And maybe to Mr. Robar, then, if um, you know the the premise behind that garage is that we get we begin to improve snow clearing. Uh, you know, there's a, a number of pieces into that. We've got an escalating operating budget over the next four years. If this project were delayed for a few years, does that put any wrinkles into the service levels, or you know, is that what impacts might that have? Not, not in the next few years. I think the efficiencies that are gained will be gained once the project is in place. So uh, over the next few years, we've run as we are now and escalate the service. Obviously, with, with the Ambleside facility, it gives us some proximity that would, uh, would help the efficiency side of it. But we'd, gain, we'd make serious gains in just the next few years with the budget increases that we have. So the efficiencies that come with that yard come a few years down the road? That's correct. Yeah, okay. $82 million. $82 million? okay. Um, I asked a question a couple of weeks ago about uh, the one percent for art, and I did. I got an email response. Can I talk about that? Is that okay? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So my understanding from from that response was that there's 17.3 million dollars available that it for for art as associated with the one percent for art, and that that has not been allocated yet. It, it I'm not sure if it sits in a reserve, but it's there somewhere. Is that number correct? That's that's correct. And if so, that feels like some a potential pocket of one-time money if we wanted to relax a policy somewhat, and I'm not suggesting all of it. Um, is that correct? Or is, would there be a policy relaxation that would be required for that? So I just want to, I'll, I'll speak to the funding and then maybe someone else can speak to the plans. But uh, so yeah, there's $17.3 million available through this, through this next four year cycle. Um, part of that is sitting in a reserve. Now I, I, like there are some commitments for that towards this capital projects. Um, and then maybe someone online can, can speak to that, but it's not it's not like it's uncommitted funding. And it, I believe it transfers over to the Arts Council. They're the ones that decide what the um, art installations would be. And so we would just, we would need to check. It would require an adjustment to the policy um, or an exemption to the policy, but we really would have to check. I think we'd have to reach out to our partners at the Arts Council to see how far down they are the path on the four-year cycle and what has been allocated out. Got it. Okay. Yeah, can we get that answer? Yeah. Yeah, I just yeah, don't have it with me. Yeah, right yeah. Now. the course of the day. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jans. Thank you for this. Um, I wanted to clarify, and I'm sorry if I missed this, I think it was in the first presentation. What, um, if I was adding together population growth plus inflation, um, what would that amount to in terms of a property tax increase? So we went up 30,000 people, so that X percent plus inflation, whatever that is, X percent equals. I don't know that I I have that number off the top of my head. I, I, I don't want to just... Sure, yeah. What, what do we say inflation is? Like, what's the Edmonton inflation metric? Felicia, are you online? Yes, good morning. I, I am online. So in terms of how uh, inflation impacts um, the tax-supported operating expenditure, we would be relying on our estimates of municipal inflation. And what's the value, Felicia? Um, I'm just going to pull it up right now. Please bear with me. Sure. And then pop growth, if we went up 30,000 people on a million, a million 70, I don't know. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to know what that number is if we went up in population growth and inflation, if that totals 5%, 7%, 12%? We can, so maybe move to your next questions, sure. ask me that in the next round, and we'll get you the answer. But if I think, if I understand correctly, you want to know if we adjusted the budget for population increase and inflation, yeah. what would the net increase be? Yeah, like when I did budgets at the school board, we were always looking for the, okay, student enrollment growth, that's X percent, so that requires more servicing, and then also the inflationary costs as well, too, and I'm just trying to figure out what that would be kind of comparatively. Are we keeping up or not, or, or reasonability there? Um, I'm interested as well on, can I ask about um, some of the matters related to carbon credits? I, yep, just want, I just wanted to um, get clarity what short-term funding may be available for this year for reallocation that is not committed. Is that, I, I am going to look to someone from the environment to help me with a question on energy recs, I think. Councillor Jans, it's <clears throat> Kent Snyder. Um, so are you, with the question for this year, 23, or for 24 going forward? Go forward. That, Go that, for yeah, that's not committed. Correct. Uh, so in 24 and 25, I believe there's about 2.5 million each year that is not being committed at this time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, Any number, any update on that in inflationary number? 
How about this? I'll yield my time now to others, but when you have it, if you don't mind uh, sharing it, that'd be... And you want me to convert it to a dollar value. That's what you want. No, no, right? no pardon me. I, I'm just looking for a percent. Like, if, if our inflation is 4% and our population growth is uh, 1%, that would be 5%. Sorry, Councillor um, Jans, I do have an update for you. For the municipal inflation rate, we forecasted it at 2.11% for 2023. And for population growth between 2022 and 2023, we have that as currently our latest forecast as 3%. So the combined increase would be 5.1%. But we also know that population growth is likely much stronger than that. We won't have any official numbers until January 2024. And sorry, municipal inflation, the one thing that we just have to be cautious, the difference between municipal inflation and consumer price index is sometimes, and I don't know if it's fair to say it's lagging, Felicia, it doesn't always capture public sector wage increases in real time. So that is correct. That is correct. So when we do not have an active settlement in place, then what we do is we re rely on the Conference Board of Canada's wage forecast for Alberta weekly wages. So what I'm hearing then is 5.1 would be the floor, and it could be higher than that given the municipal inflation. That's correct. Okay. So any conceivably, anything less than 5.1% uh, would be less resources per Edmontonian than the year before. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie, and, and maybe just one last piece on that. Uh, again, I, I heard the current estimate around 3% for population growth, but and we won't know the final numbers till January, but if we're using 40, because I think the, in that update a few months ago, we were sort of projected at 40,000. That could be, I'm guessing, around 35 to 3.7% if based off our current population. Yes, so if we're looking at an uh, increase of 3% or any, or even looking at an annualized rate of 4%, it could be in, in that range, correct? Yeah, okay. And, 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 I, and I know that question, uh, sort of that, that conversation around population plus uh, inflation is, is one that's been raised by even groups like the Chamber of Commerce, I think, over the years, that they've suggested that's generally a, a, a reasonable target for us to consider. I, I think about past public hearings. Is that, does that sound right? I, I feel like that's what I remember hearing them talk about over the past. Yeah, I think so. And I think even if I go back to the audit done, um, I can't remember the name of the audit was, where they looked at the expenditures over time. Oh, yeah. I would say this, it's a reasonable, it's, and we certainly use this, yep. it's a reasonable indicator for a consistent level of services. But if mm -hmm. you're looking to grow and enhance the services, it would be difficult to cover that. Yeah, and and maybe to that point, I guess, because you know, while we're working on a city plan that strives to to see fifty percent uh, in mature neighborhoods at the current rate, we're seeing about seventy percent of folks move into new areas that are currently unserviced. Is that generally what we're faced with right now, Ms. Patron? I think our our uh, redevelopment is in the thirty five or thirty six percent range. Yeah. So oh, okay. So we're at, we're at close to about sixty five percent now as new areas, and and so I guess to your point, Ms. Padbury, is that we also have to think about that. So if if we're seeing forty thousand people move in in each year, and you know the last two years have been significant growth, it doesn't seem like we're going to stop anytime soon. Um, that's part of the pressure as well, because even with the offsite levies conversation right now, we can rec we can we can recover the cost of roads, utilities, and the fire hall, but the police station, the parks, the rec centers, the libraries, those are all things we still have to pay for in these areas in these new parts of the city. That's correct. So it's that, and then if you change a service level, if yeah. you decide that you want a city with more parks or a greater number of recreation facilities. Those types of things wouldn't be contemplated by population yeah. plus inflation growth. Yeah. Those would be net new adds to service. Absolutely. Right. And I would also add, Councillor, that there are things that are not our, in our jurisdiction that also need to be added as primarily schools. Yes. And there is no path um, that would support that kind of growth from a school perspective at this point, as yep. far as we know. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go very specific to, uh, to Ms. Patron again on the on one of the unfunded ones and and. Uh, the heritage management unfunded package there, and I know that's like in a world of priorities. I, I, I appreciate there's there's a lot of com competing needs, but I do just want to ask if 
if we don't fund that program, I've heard sort of a mix of views. We, we had an audit that said we need to do certain work. I've heard on one hand that we're gonna make sure we still somehow comply with the audit even, even if this package isn't funded. But I guess I wanna figure out how, how we actually do that because I think the, the, the recommendations feel like we actually have to ultimately do that work at some point and I'm just trying to figure out when we do that and, and how that helps us. So I'm gonna jump in first oh, here sure. and yeah. just make an observation about audit recommendations. Yeah. I think that it's fair that the auditor makes audit recommendations, but ultimately as counsel, you can choose whether you want to fund all of that or not. Um, and, and different audit recommendations come with different things. So if it's a service level, you have a choice. If yeah. it's a compliance issue, you might not have a choice. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, and I appreciate that. I just, I know that I, I can't think of any other audit we actually haven't generally fulfilled the recommendations on beyond this one. And so that, that's why I just wanted to ask questions about it to help inform this. So I, I guess, Ms. Petron, I wouldn't mind your thoughts on, on that. So certainly um, the Heritage Resource Management Plan now that we have was adopted in 2009. So certainly things have shifted and changed over time and further to the city auditor from uh, report from 2021 um, that recommended to continue to be effective, we would prepare a new management plan. Um, so until that body of work is funded, um, administration is not able to complete it. Okay, I'm out of time, I might come back around, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Councillor Prince, Councillor can you take the? I'll chair, take please? the chair. Yeah. Uh, just want to follow up on Councillor Cartmel's questions, uh, Adam. Uh, you know, we have this call from a uh, number of uh, business uh, organizations that we should look at uh, either uh, we, we should look at delaying some of the major infrastructure projects. So what I'm hearing from you is delaying would add more cost in the future years. Correct, right? Escal escalation even pre-pandemic right. would add two and a half percent to a, a construction value. Okay, so delaying is- Post-pandemic, yeah. anywhere from two and a half to 10% oh. just based on the type of infrastructure. So delaying is not an option, right? Or it isn't always an option, but it will be costly if, if council is committed to doing those projects, delaying is not fiscally responsible decision. Am we I, wouldn't recommend that. You wouldn't if, recommend that. If council was looking to create savings, you make the decision to cancel projects. So canceling project would have Correct. impact, right? But then that's a decision. But we wouldn't recommend that as well because you've already given direction decision that has these been, are the projects. Been made. But I, I don't, uh, I think it's important to clarify that point because these are smart people out in the in the business committee, I'm pretty sure they will understand the implications of uh, delaying projects that have been already approved, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, on the, I have a number of questions on the perception survey. Uh, if somebody's around, I'll start with slide number seven that talks about primary opportunities, uh, homelessness response and support. Yes, people expect us to take leadership, but it's a shared responsibility and same on affordable housing and low income household for low income houses. I want to start with some of the core city responsibilities. What are the reasons that people are not satisfied for community safety? I understand some of them because we hear from community. Um, can you highlight me what you heard? What are the concerns being raised? And I'm going to ask those questions on re the rest of the uh, the areas as well. Can you highlight some of the things that you heard why people are not satisfied the work we are doing on community safety? Thank you for the question. Um, I can answer what we heard yeah. um, and then I'll call on another colleague to kind of answer and respond to um, some of the work that we're doing if that's fair, uh, David Jones. Um, some of the things that we heard are, it's a lot about the perceptions of safety. This is ultimately the satisfaction survey comes down to people's perception. Um, so there was lots of comments around downtown safety. Mm -hmm. There were comments around transit safety, questions around policing. Um, there was, there's an open-ended question that we ask in the survey, and those are some of the, the key concerns and areas. Okay. And did people understood or shared 
some of the investment we are making in, in community safety or were they unaware of those investments? There's through the survey mechanism, there is no education component oh, to um, provide information about what we're doing. Um, and that is primarily to balance uh, the time and the length of survey. So we wouldn't be able to validate through the survey question um, that they had or do not have that information. Um, but it did ask a question around what they would like to see around investment uh, okay. in those spaces. And what did you hear about why are not people satisfied with public transit? Um, the public transit concerns that were identified in the survey were mainly about safety. Um, okay. There was a few around um, timeliness and, and completeness of um, service, um, but the primary concern was around safety. Okay. And uh, winter road maintenance? Um, winter road maintenance, there was probably less um, commentary around, um, just service levels, uh, residential, road clearings, um, and communication, um, I would say, were the top ones there. But it is notable that that was one of the three areas that had a, an ever so slight um, increase uh, over last year as well. Okay. And spring, summer's road maintenance? Sorry, pardon me, can you just repeat the, the question? Spring, the left. spring, summer road maintenance. Um, those were mainly to do with road closures uh, and timeliness of potholes were some of the comments. Oh, I see. Okay, got it. Because I'm the reason I'm asking that every time we have a report in front of us, I'm finding that we are not meeting community's expectations or the standards that we set on transit. The report came to us, we are short through 260,000 hours. On snow and ice, we heard we are short. Now we're finally catching up. On turf maintenance, I hear the same thing. So I'm really struggling, Andre, when you build a budget, right? How do you, how do you factor all these inputs? Maybe I'll come back to, uh, to, to that question because I'm running out of time. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll move the second round. Second. Thank you. Moved by Mayor Sohi, seconded by Councillor Nack. Please vote on the next round. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. I'll take the I'll chair. I'll return the chair. Thank you. Uh, here we go. I'll just wait for the list. I think it was Councilor Wright was next. Councilor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. So back to the trees. Um, so it, it indicated in the service package um, seven, or sorry, just over two million, um, but from the audit report, it looks like it was seven point four million. Was what was needed? I'll let Craig I'm, jump in on that. Sorry, do you mind just re-asking the question? You're um, referring to both the the twenty twenty one audit is or the twenty twenty audit uh, and no. the service package. Sorry, I thought this was related because I couldn't see any relation to the 2021 audit that was done from the, th the auditor's three recommendations. So I'm looking at the, um, the June 2023 audit committee meeting. Um, it looks like the urban forest maintenance and care budget was requested to be 7.4 million. Yeah, so just to clarify, um, I did see that email thread earlier today about which audit it was. Okay. And the, the forestry audit, um, it is. Uh, it was. It was done in 20, uh, 2020 That carried out the the forestry services audit. Um, so that was the service package that we were referring to. Um, so there were a number of different service packages that came forward in December of twenty twenty two to be a part of the twenty three to twenty six budget. Okay. Um, those were not funded at that time, uh, and then through a motion uh, earlier this year was was directed for administration to bring those service packages back. So they've been combined uh, into a single service package. Uh, so that's probably why the math doesn't add up exactly as we've taken a number of different service packages and put them into one for this for this particular SOBA. Okay, so I'm just wondering, because it is audit required and practically necessary, is this something that can be set up as a priority for OP12 to have funds redirected or reallocated? 
I think that's always your choice as council to prioritize whatever we produce in savings. Okay, so but do you need direction? Like would I have to provide a subsequent motion for that? Well, I think the process for OP12 would be we identify where there are savings or amounts available for reallocation, then you decide what to allocate. But I think we have to first have the savings there before you can make that decision. Okay, so not, at this point, not necessary for a subsequent motion to, di to direct that, because that work's being done. It's when you find the money, which I know you will, um, then at that time we would direct where those funds what would be? What the use of the funds is, yeah. Okay. okay. And if council agrees with where we find the money, which right. is, as you know, been some of the challenge over the last six months. Yeah, there's 13 people on council with 13 different opinions. I got it, okay. Um, so my next question then is going to the other unfunded for the temporary and seasonal workers to permanent. I'm okay to go? I know, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think, I think <laughs> Councillor uh, Rutherford, Rutherford get bumped off the list, so that's what okay. she was saying. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, um, again, that one, um, is that one, I think is shown as being, oh, sorry, it's not showing as practically necessary, but in the commentary it talks about it provides for a more stable workforce. Why wouldn't that make it practi practically necessary? For me, Councillor, it just doesn't fit within the criteria that we talk, we talk about practically necessary. I mean, the, the alternative is, is we, we continue to hire uh, temporary uh, members of the temporary workforce and continue to manage our workforce as we have been. So we've got a, a pretty good contingent that have been transferred to permanent and this would, uh, the, the unfunded package re, you know, relates to the last 150 or so that we had targeted. And maybe I, I would just add that when we look at, is it and in terms of core service, practically necessary, we look at it at the level of the service, not in the manner in which the service is delivered. But so what's important is, is, the, is the service that is being provided core. There are many different ways to provide a core service. But by, I guess by, Improving the employee experience, doesn't that then result in, in, in better service to Edmontonians? Employee if, if experience happy is your one job. of the things that we think about, yeah. but it isn't something that comes into play in the definition of a core service. Uh, I see your point, Councillor, right? And I think it really kind of depends on the employee. We have lots of temporary employees who do a great job, do a fantastic job, and yes, are they happier if they're permanent? which we agree with and we're moving towards to. But I would also say that a lot of temporary employees do a fantastic job, provide an excellent level of service, even though they may not be um, permanent. Are they happier if they're permanent? Do they, have more, uh, do they have more job security? Absolutely, I agree with all those things. And so that's better, and that's why we've been working for three years to, to move more temporaries to private. Okay, to, and some temporary enjoy you. the flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, just on the satellite garage, um, is, that, is that an interim, uh, I guess an interim lease that would not continue beyond 2030 once the uh, permanent new garage is in place? I uh, just wanna make sure I'm fully understanding Yes, the intent of that facility is to use it as a temporary facility until okay. the new garage expansion happens. Okay, okay, thank you for that clarity. Um, just a question on, on Metro to Blatchford. So uh, funding the operations of the new permanent Nate station. Just wondering like, how close are we to decommissioning the temporary station and, and getting the new one up and, uh, up and activated? Q1, like, is that something that could happen really Q1, quickly, I guess? Q2 of next year. Okay. Okay, and then on fees and licensing. So looking at, at the updated fee and licensing schedule, I guess just a few, few questions here. So when I look at um, proposed fees 24, 25, 26, bump in 24, 
and then going back to uh, sort of baseline in 25 and 26, just trying to understand the rationale there. Like, we're, if we're increasing, are we not keeping that steady state, or why would we why are we reducing in 25 and 26? And I'm looking at you know assessment and tax service fees, property tax certificates, property tax searches, new property tax certificates, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that Mr. Zabo or Ms. Watt are online, so maybe let them speak to this. Sure. Uh, hello, Council. Would you mind repeating the question? Sure. So I'm just looking at the proposed um, fees and li fees and licensing schedule, and uh, it looks like we're we're doing a slight increase in 2024 uh, to a variety of assessment and tax service fees. But then 2025 and 2026, we're going back down. Um, just trying right. to understand the rationale there. Uh, to be frank, there's no particular rationale. It's just a peculiarity of the budget office. They're just looking for us to um, update the current budget. So we were updating for 2024. Uh, you can expect that in 2025 and 26, we will update again. Um, just a reminder that the council passes the fees bylaw every year. So every year there'll be an opportunity to, to look at these fees. But yeah, that, that appearing as it as it does is not uh, is not uh, considered. We won't be putting the fees down unless council directs us to do that. I think this is just an element of maybe conservatism that we have in the budget because we're adjusting the fee for one year and we come back and adjust again. What we don't do is we adjust the fee for the one year when we know the bylaw is set, but I don't adjust the budget for the out years when I don't have a bylaw for them yet. We just leave them at their estimates. It prevents us from having to find money later if you choose to bring fees down. Mm -hmm. Some, okay. It's something we can look at. I think it's just a, a... Sure, sure. Yeah, I had just flagged it on my end, but if it's if it's more of a process question of, of the timing of the bylaws coming forward, I can understand that. But I guess just for consistency's sake, it, it would make sense in my mind to see that um, on a go-forward basis as well. Um, yeah, and maybe just with my last minute here, sorry to stick with the, the fees and fines questions, but um, I'm just really trying to understand the rationale for how we determine, you know, a 50 cent increase, 75 cent increase on some of those fees. Like, totally understand that it needs to be reasonable, rational. What, what thought process goes into making those determinations? And I'll, I'll stick with assessment and tax services fees. For sure. Um, it, we do every year uh, an informal survey of uh, other municipalities within the province to see what they're charging for similar products and services. And we take that information and we adjust our fees so that we arrive at generally the, the median fee that's being charged across the province with some consideration for the amount of time it takes for the assessment and taxation staff to actually perform the work to provide this service. So in some cases, we are not wholly in alignment with other municipalities in the province. And the justification for those are because it takes our staff a particular amount of time to, uh, with our systems to deliver that service. Okay. Um, the, the full explanation of this comes forward in the fees bylaw yeah. setting process. Okay. Okay, I'm out of time, thanks. Clarification, if I could, uh, I said Q1, Q2, it'll be Q1 and optimistically early. Good. That's on the? Metro line to Blotch. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Constable Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just wanted to ask about the bike lanes. We're, we have one profile that's $100 million, but we have other profiles that we're spending on bike lanes. Do we have a cost of the amounts of the other profiles? Mm, not broken down because they're actually part of um, neighborhood renewal. They're part of arterial improvements when there's opportunities to implement. Um, so to, to slice it out would be quite challenging because um, active transportation improvements are part of alignment with council policy related to complete streets, uh, uh, the neighborhood renewal policy, sidewalk strategy, etc. Okay, so it's in different, yeah, as you said, neighborhood renewal, 
and arterial road upgrades. Okay. All right. What is the impact on the tax levy for the bike lane, the $100 million profile? Hold on one second. I'll just switch tabs here. Uh, it grows to $7 million a year. Okay. And do we have... Um, can I get the 10-year history of the percentage of expenditure for debt repayment? I, I don't have the percentage, but I have the values. Okay, values um, then. So if I go back to, and we can get you the percentage later in the day. If I go back to 2012, we were spending, or our debt servicing was approximately $223 million a year. It grew 255 in 2013, 319 in 2014, reduced to 285 in 2015, 341 million in 16, 264 in 2017, 284 in 18, 301 in 2019, 313 million in 2020, 335 million in 2021, and 342 million in 2022. And I can just circulate the table um, for all of council and put the percentages in. Okay, that's great. So we're seeing a trend of it increasing our debt repayment as opposed to decreasing. Yeah, that's uh, fair. Yeah, okay. And um, Mr. Lachlan, I know you had said delaying projects increases prices and that's, I mean, that's realistic. I think that's obvious, but uh, would you say that doing too many projects possibly at once uh, might be, um, uh, you know, it just it, it might be more impactful doing too many projects at once? Is it better to smooth out projects over time? It's a consideration. What I would say in the 23 to 26 capital budget, it's not different than previous budget cycles in terms of value or composition of projects. We have very some very large uh, projects, LRT, Yellowhead Trail, uh, 50th Street grade separation, and that's supplemented with um, uh, the regular uh, sort of uh, renewal projects that are typically a big component to a capital budget. What I will say is that, uh, and we've shared this previously, the degree of renewal dollars that have been allocated uh, are not meeting uh, the desirable investment that, that we would uh, like to see. Um, so uh, I would say at this budget cycle, we're not doing too much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Those are my only questions for now. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, can I just, I'll just correct oh, sure. the tax supported debt number for the active, the 100 million in active transportation. Um, just to give you the detail, it is 247,000 in 2024, and it grows up until 2029. And 2029 is the first year that you have the full debt servicing for the 100 million, and that is 7.8. Okay, and you know what, I will quickly ask, so how many years are will we be paying for the $100 million profile? So the last payment for the 100 million profile would be in 2053, because we borrow for, I believe it's 20 years, but we're borrowing at different points in time. So do you have a total? Uh, the Everything? total cost of, you want the total cost of borrowing? Yes. Uh, 195324000 Oh, okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Tang. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I, well, I wanted to just make sure I have the clarity on the treat maintenance one. So just back to that question. Um, sounds like if this is an unfunded service package, if it remains unfunded, there is some support in the federal grant funding for the next three years, and then we will have to reconsider something for the next budget cycle. Is that is that correct, Mr. McEwen? Or Craig? That is correct. Okay, great, thank you. Um, but in the four-year cycle then, given that this is kind of a, 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 a necessary investment on this, project, would it just come back as a funded service package or could it? 
I think whether it comes back funded or not often depends on all of the things that we're dealing with at the time we establish the budget and what we believe to be the tax tolerance. Um, right. So I guess I, I, I would just hate for something like that to hang in the air and then we just end up having a bunch of trees that no one can plant, right? Because no, I'm not sure it's trees no one can plant, but it's the service level around the maintenance of the trees that are planted. Okay. Well, I'm I'm just putting that out there as well as because um, I feel like, you know, maybe we have the support for now, but not if not in the four year cycle for the next four year cycle. Maybe that's something to consider. Um, I want to come back to the encampment, the core, uh, maybe specifically the core encampment piece. Um, I think in the past year or so that we've had a number of reports on our en uh, enhanced encampment approach. Um, I think we've seen a few things that have yet to come to fruition. For example, the RFP for the indigenous housing. Um, I'm wondering, because this one is so heavily focused on enforcement, I'm wondering during the last while, because I don't feel like I've heard a lot, what are some of the alternative roles um, you have explored to complement or um, as a, not alternative, but uh, to complement the work that the enforcement, the cleanup crew are doing to support people, say, get to a better place of receiving help and um, not constantly returning back to, to their campsites. So I understand, are you speaking more about uh, a commentary on, on how extensive the outreach is and how we are no, I'm getting... No, I'm not talking about outreach. You know, I, I, I think a, long, a while ago, you know, a very long time ago, we've, when we started this conversation, we had, there were a number of prototypes that were in, in motion, uh, and part of it is to explore what are some alternative ways, and since the last budget cycle, the whole point of adjusting the encampment is to say, how are we going to do things differently? And in the, in the last report, I think the, really the only thing I've really seen that's different is the RFP that we have put out for our indigenous housing. And I'm guess, I guess I'm just wondering um, if there's other work that's exploring alternatives to, to, to say, complement the work of enforcement officers. I understand, thank you. I'll maybe get Stacy to respond to, uh, if there's any update on our prototypes. Uh, yes, yeah, so the updates on the prototypes uh, will still be forthcoming in terms of the report on that, uh, but prototypes uh, were continuing throughout the summer working uh, with uh, encampments to identify a whole range of how we might uh, work better together, whether that's uh, encouraging uh, mental health supports through uh, arts and creativity, whether that's how to keep encampments clean, how to connect folks to services. Uh, so we continue to actively work directly with um, individuals in encampments to try to improve the way that not only we as a city, uh, but I think we as a community can, can respond and can connect folks to whatever supports they need, whether they be housing or otherwise. And Crystal's on the line. She can per perhaps add a bit more. That's okay. I, I'm not necessarily asking for housing support for folks um, exactly. But so that work that you just described, Stacey, then will continue. Um, and you don't need additional resource outside of what's proposed here. Because this is very specific, right, to a certain element of our encampment approach. We will, we will always continue to work with our community and work with those in encampments to try to improve the way in which we respond. Uh, as you know, we're currently working on the community plan to end homelessness, as well as our corporate plan will be coming forward uh, next year as well. So uh, those conversations continue. Um, there is support included in the enhanced package uh, to help evolve those, the prototype and the prototype approach. Yeah, I don't think I read it that way for the enhanced package. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rutherford. Okay, just jumping still with the transit. So, um, what is the minimum amount of buses that we would need to sort of make that viable? Because I know that Count, that um, Carrie had mentioned yesterday that there was a scalability factor to it, that there's a scalability factor to it. So, just wanting to know. Okay, if we if we start with purchasing X number of because it's forty, but what could we realistically start with that would still make this viable and help? Yeah, I'll turn that over to Carrie. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think uh, starting with an increment of ten would be really positive. 
uh, in all quadrants of the city, especially if combined with the Valley Line hours, all quadrants of the city would benefit. So some of it will be new routes, extending existing routes, improving frequencies, uh, and those types of things. And would there be a redistribution of the on-demand as well? So for example, if there's currently on-demand that is justifying uh, one of these regular transit routes, then those on-demand hours could go to another area which maybe doesn't have the demand yet, but can start to, to acclimatize that way. Is that is my understanding correct? It is 100% correct. Uh, and through our annual service plan, uh, when we bring that forward in Q1, we would outline all of that uh, shift that we would make. Okay, perfect. Thank you for those answers. Uh, to uh, Ms. Petrin, I just want to know, like there was a lot of subsequence to zoning bylaw and your team is working on district planning. Um, is, is the resources realistic for what the expectations of the public in this council are for your area? I think, <clears throat> I think through the subsequent motions of the zoning bylaw, uh, we identified the ones that could be accommodated through our, our work plan. Um, and the ones, <clears throat> excuse me, that aren't are uh, through the unfunded service packages that you see in the, as part of the uh, budget proposal. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, is there any, but there's also opportunity when you come back with that plan to reprioritize, for example, within the current resources? That's correct. So in, I think it's Q1 of 2024, we're uh, at Urban Planning Committee related to the work plan for the zoning bylaw team. Um, not everything is going to be done first, so we'll be prioritizing and be looking for feedback from committee through that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I just, my last set of questions, again, this is what I'm really grappling with. Is there a direction that needs to happen, maybe potentially as a subsequent, around planning and design of infrastructure? Um, and I ask this again because I'm just seeing, again, this is a conversation, I'm seeing all of these operational pressures, both from growth, but also from the way we're designing things, right? So there's a lot of beds that we're putting in, in neighborhood renewal that are really nice until they're full of weeds. Um, and, and while we can't address that in, in the immediate because we've already built that, how are we stopping that drain going on, an on, on a forward going basis? Yeah, I'll start, Councillor, just by saying I don't think there's any direction required. Adam and I were talking about that this week and we've done some initial work on it. We're going to do more work on it. We're going to come back to Council with some recommendations on that. Um, oh, perfect. We've, we've actually done recently comparisons between how many beds we have compared to Calgary and how many tree stands and those yeah. kinds of things and, and the numbers are quite different. So Well, and I even think about something like, and I'm not meaning to pick on IAS, but you know, I think about Calder Neighborhood Renewal, and it's it's great that we've got sidewalks, but they did put those fancy intersections with the the the, the interlaid brick on 129th Avenue. Um, and I now also know that in Greaseba, there's a ton of those crosswalks that are crumbling, and then we're just paving over them, and it looks terrible. So I'm just trying to, like, why are we building that in the first place? So I and I and I again, it's it, the reason I'm bringing up in budget is because I just want to make sure that if we're, it, it, is, it is affecting our ongoing pressures on the operation side for how we build the capital. Yep, and, and that's the work we're doing. Kay. So I, I, think, I think the team's on it and okay. we'll be coming back to council with some recommendations on that. Do you have a timeline for that, Adam? Well, part of it is linked to complete streets and the update that's related to that. Uh, certainly, it's, it's an ongoing effort to improve. Part of it comes from the engagement that happens with community and you referenced a particular street that's actually stamped uh, asphalt. It's not concrete brick, so it's a little bit different and it's learning from some of those other oh, experiences. Great. And it's also informed by uh, particular areas that, you know, I, I think what we're trying to rationalize is there's a, a right place for that type of infrastructure based on the type of corridor, uh, but it's it shouldn't be everywhere in, uh, and in all locations. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Well, before I go to Councillor Stevenson again, right? <laughs> Every time I go to Councillor Stevenson, we have visitors uh, uh, coming to see us. Okay, another class from Bishop Gresjak School, grade six, and with their teacher, Mrs. S. Sikorsky, right? Yeah, right on. And, uh, uh, and your ward counselor is Councillor Principe Teswiniwak. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for joining us. We saw your other uh, uh, classmates earlier on. Uh, are you two separate groups or you were just divided for uh, two different classes, same school? Are you participating in the uh, in the mock council as well? You you have done yours. What are you were talking about? What was the topic of discussion? Oh, the same topic that your other uh, uh, classmates. So what did you decide? Uh, what's your name, sir? Uh, Mayor, what's your name? Roland. Roland? Mayor Roland. OK. Yeah. What did you decide? Well, come down here. We have a lot of time. Come on, come on down. Come on. Come on. We have a lot of time. We, we you know, we got to mentor kids to run for mayor and uh, council. So give them the opportunity and confidence. And Jeremy is going to record them. Jeremy, turn, turn the camera on him. There you go. There you go. You're, you're, you'll be watched. <laughs> we said against for the vote. Against for You voted against making LRT free? No, not free. Because huh. they didn't want it free. Oh, you didn't want it free. What was the vote? How, was the, how many people voted in to keeping, to make it free and uh, not to make it free? Two for free and ten for not free. Wow. Oh, wow. Can you give us one reason why? They said because it could get trashed and it could be dangerous because everybody would be like getting on it. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's that's a very interesting perspective. Anyone in favor for making it free? What was the argument for that? They just wanted it free because the children could get on and the adults. Okay, so the adults could, uh, kids could ride with the adults. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing that uh, that with us. So we are talking about budget, and we started uh, last week or week before, and yesterday we started uh, asking questions to our administration as well as to uh, other agencies that the city uh, works with and provide funding to. So budget is basically about the the money that city collects from uh, households and businesses and how we allocate that money to provide services like uh, transit service, for example, building LRT. Uh, funding police, funding fire service, funding uh, recreational facilities, removing snow, cl cleaning our sidewalks and uh, parks, recreational facilities, libraries, I can go on and on, the list that we provide. And I will give in a plug on behalf of all of us and on behalf of administration, um, all the things that we do for the city cost about $8.74 per day. To, your, uh, to Edmontonians, an average cost per household, which I think is pretty reasonable for all the services that you access, right? So please uh, share that with your parents. Tell them, actually tell them to watch. Very, I, I know I'm going to give another plug in on part of the administration. We had a very good presentation yesterday from the administration, right at the start of this conversation. It's very easy to understand. It's not complicated. They put it in a very simple way. Uh, with graphs and very accessible information. So if you get a chance, maybe I'll ha ask your teacher to do that, right? Uh, uh, go to the city website and access that report and go through that report or ask your parents to go to that report, right? Uh, go through that report. It's very, uh, uh, I was very informative about the services that city provides and also how much does it cost to provide those services. So I would, I would encourage you to do that, okay? Mayor, would you tell, will you ask your colleagues to do that? Good, thank you so much. 
All right, great. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Okay, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, I'm never as entertaining as, as the schools, but I will do my best. Um, back to the fees. So, so I understand we, we set those based on sort of a median fee across the province, also consideration of our time. Do we look at sort of overhead, other overhead components or, or strictly staff time? Uh, hello, Councillor. We, we do take as much as we possibly can into consideration and also with a view for what is considered reasonable, which is why we do that informal survey of other municipalities. I could not say that we've done a very comprehensive breakdown of exactly time, materials, and overhead in the setting of these fees. Um, we could do that, but it, it would be a, a piece of work that we would we would have to allocate into our work plans. Okay, and then just in terms of that reasonableness, um, is there any external um, arbitrator of that? Like, let's say we were to set it, you know, I think, um, let's say it was, you know, objectively unreasonable. It's a thousand dollars for something that other municipalities is ten dollars. What what would be the mechanisms? How would we be held accountable for that unreasonableness? That's an excellent question. It's something that that we internally have been asking. I think the best person to respond to that might be Michael Gunther from the Law Department. Okay, are you on on the line? Yeah, oh, I right. I certainly am. And so the risk is. Uh, Councillor, that if our fees are, are too high, we could be challenged on those fees and an application could be made to the court to have those fees uh, declared in value. Okay, and that would be like an individual citizen could do that or like who has standing? Anyone who's been charged that fee? Anyone who's been uh, required to pay that fee would uh, have the opportunity if they felt it was unfair uh, to bring that application to court. Okay, and what's what's the level of risk? I mean, clearly if we get to the the magnitude of a thousand, I, you know, I, I see the risk there, you know, what, what's the risk around, you know, for looking at ones of dollars or tens of dollars? Well, counselor, we have to ensure that our fees are of a reasonable magnitude and they're not so um, exorbitant or out of touch with the reasonable cost of offering a service that they would constitute a tax. So when we're talking about uh, small changes in, in incremental value, um, it's a low risk uh, proposition, but as soon as we're unable to tie it back to what the cost of providing that service is, it does definitely make it more difficult for the lawyers who would be looking to defend that uh, charge. Great. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I think my last question is just uh, flipping to slide nine of the presentation uh, where we see um, the the ratio of EPS expenditures as a total of, uh, as a total of city expenditures. I was just unclear on the f how we arrived at the fourteen point six percent on that. I know the report we received on the funding formula in August uh, in attachment four. It shows um, you know the twenty twenty three allocation being at about twenty eight point nine. Um, you know that uh, attachment shows the expenditure is getting up to 30.5 in 2026. So just wondering the different ways of calculating 14. Yeah, so there are many different ways to calculate depending on what it is. What we're showing in this slide is on your total $3.5 billion budget, the expenditure line for police is roughly 14.6%. The policy has a cap and the cap is what gets calculated with that 30% that cap would be police expenditures as a ratio of civic expenditures. So just a portion of the total city expenditures, okay. just the departments. So civic expenditures is the departments. When we look at total expenditure, that includes support for our external ABCs. Debt servicing, debt all servicing. that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a really helpful clarification, and I think those are all my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Just a couple more. Now, normally I wouldn't get this deep into this, but I'm looking at something called Tweedle Place Living Wall for $186,000. Is there someone that can explain what that is? 
So I believe Craig is online and he can explain it what it is, but I believe this is an asset we uh, were transferred from EPCOR. That, that's right. It was originally designed and built when drainage was a city department. Um, and then EPCOR took on the construction. Uh, and then just this past summer, that asset has been handed over to the city to continue operating and maintaining. So it's, a, it's, it's physically a living wall with, with willow trees. Uh, it's on the east side of 91st Street, uh, just I think it was north or south of the White Mud. Um, but it's, uh, it's a unique asset where it's um, dirt and willows to be a noise attenuation wall from 91st Street uh, to the adjacent neighborhood. So it is in existence. It's there. <clears throat> it has uh, um, like the water lines and it requires uh, ongoing maintenance, inspections. Uh, it's an engineered structure uh, that is now a city asset. Okay. Yes, I know the wall now that you're referring to. Um, I'm just looking at that cost versus 400 some thousand dollars for a trim cycle for the entire city. But I'm musing now, so I'll stop. Um, have we examined uh, potential gaps and overlaps between uh, community safety and well being, FCSS, CIOG? Arts Council grants to various organizations, that kind of thing. Feels like that there's a number, I, one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, but we have a lot of grants, but it seems that we have a number of different vehicles uh, offering those grants. And I'm wondering about how many of those grants from different places are going to the same organizations to do the same thing. Have we, have we done an analysis of that? Or that's the, just, I'll just leave it there. Have we done one? I'm fairly confident that the outcomes are sufficiently different uh, from those various grants that you've mentioned um, that regardless if there are similar recipients, the work and projects are different, but we can certainly take that away and we can do that analysis. Um, but the ones that you've quoted, like FCSS is about prevention, um, CIOG is, is for smaller and, and not for, uh, smaller and medium sized not-for-profits, uh, working on sport council things, like, so they are fairly different, but I take your point and we'd be happy to do uh, a memo uh, su summarizing some of those things if that's helpful. Well, I think- We are doing some work in response to the audit too, um, yeah. which asked us to look at what, um, whether we have enough information in the programs on whether they're achieving the targets. Yeah, I might, I might offer a subsequent, I'll think about that. And if it overlaps with other motions, that's fine. It can be combined. Um, I just, I wonder about that. I, you know, some of the conversations have, that I've had with some of those groups talk about things that I would call, as, as one example, aids to daily living. So I'm not sure why we're granting money to an organization that turns around and buys equipment that people can get from the provincial government. So I'd like there's, you know, just as one very anecdotal example. Um, yeah, just on that, Councillor, I think yes, there's two things. There's one, is there overlap? Second is it gets back to the core services or not? Yes, absolutely. Uh, which is, you'll have the same comment to my next question. Early childhood learning. Uh, we heard, I think, yesterday that it's roughly $180,000 that would be required for the city to get involved in um, guiding the early childhood learning and care work that the other levels of government are doing. Um, I guess my question is, is it not possible to find a way to do that work without adding $180,000 to the operating budget? Yeah, again, it gets to which order of government should do that work and would they be willing to do it if it's not us as a core service? Yeah, yeah but in that, from that respect, local perspective matters, um, you know, whereas, and I, I, those neighborhoods that do not have necessarily the same accessibility to those other levels of government, or those that do, reap the rewards, those that don't, don't. And is there some equalization factor that we bring if we offer that local perspective? Uh, I think there can be for sure. Yeah, yeah I just, yeah. I don't. It's, do we want to pay for that? Yeah. Well, yeah. my question is more, perhaps rhetorically, do we always have to tick the operating budget up by 180 grand when we want to do something like that? So, yeah, understood. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Reis. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Tohi. I still want to go back the um, budget expenditure um, <clears throat> reflect in this adjustment. Uh, for the, uh, 
I want to go back. The first one is about that uh, uh, twenty-six million dollars listed as a revenue and on operating budget right now, and also budgeted as expenditure. So my question is, can we hold that and in the operating budget? Why we need to spend all of them? So it's it is effectively one-time revenue that is coming into the budget that we're transferring to capital. You can't. You could hold it and not spend it, but it would be held and not spent for capital. You can't, if your question is, can I use it to reduce the tax levy? The answer is no, because it's one time and it'll create a problem for next year. So how could one time it will create a problem for next year? Because right now we're looking at revenue pool. We, we're looking at expenditure pool. And if we have expenditure more than revenue, that is the reason why cost the tax increase. And then for us to do the better planning and look at all the revenue pool and to say which money we should hold, which money we should spend it. And then... So this money isn't contributing to the tax increase because I'm transferring, it's coming in, and then we're transferring it to capital. So the increase, that's a net zero increase in taxes. If you were to use it to reduce taxes, it's money that doesn't exist next year, so I'd have to add it back and it would increase taxes next year. This is why we're keeping, we're having it come in, it's one-time money, we're having it flow out to capital. Our capital budget practices are designed this way to prevent the volatility that creates fluctuations in tax levy increases. Uh, but however, uh, yes, mathematics, I said this yesterday, mathematics, <clears throat> which we try to balance, there is no impact for the tax levy. Uh, <clears throat> However, if we have this money and keep in the revenue pool, we can, based on what needs and from city operating and also from city council uh, priorities, and we can, we, can, we can do that reallocation and in the better planning. So, you but, are uh, but doing I that, did, but I, on the capital side. But I, I heard here, but there is no rule say you cannot hold it, right? There is you no can, policy, no rule say you cannot hold it. You can hold it, but you can hold it only for one-time things. We've used a portion of this to yes. fund some yeah, of the capital. Yeah. So if you want this $26 million to be held, you have to unfund enough capital to make the capital pool $26.2 million. But if for the capital pool right now, and then you still have... Fifty-one million dollars available and promise. no, twelve point four million dollars available. There was fifty-one point four, and then after we allocate out the the capital budget adjustments, there's twelve point four unallocated left. That is only based on the all the proposed adjustment approved, but right now we're not yet. But that's and what we we've what that's what we've proposed to you. So yes, if that you, is proposed, not, not approved yet. And right now we are still discussing this. So that, I just want to point this out very clearly. And we are still shortfall and for the capital pool because the capital adjustment need is $80.9 million. So we are still shortfall after you add this $26.8 million in. So this is reports indicated very clear. Um, okay, thank you for that answer. And then I, I may come up with some uh, amendment. Um, the next question is going to the taxation appeals adjustment. For this piece, an uh, easy increase compared to the original approved budget, $3.1 million. Uh, what's the rationale for this increase? on expenditure side. Do you like me to answer that, Stacy? Sure. Um, it's a number of things, Councillor. Firstly, when we do our projections for four years, we have to kind of guess what uh, amount Council is likely to approve in terms of tax levy increase. And then as we get further along the four-year cycle, we're able to refine and adjust in these budget adjustments, because as you can well understand, as the tax levy increases, the individual amounts that are under appeal 
also increase by that amount. So for the city, there is more tax dollars at risk as the level of taxation increases. So this is a secondly, there is another aspect to this, which is that we are seeing more appeals. Um, so there is naturally more tax dollars at risk year on year. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have enough funds to cover any losses we may incur on that side. Okay, this thank, is based on thank, assumption. Okay. Yeah, thank you, okay, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Jens. Thank you. Um, I think one of the threads that I picked up on an administration's presentation is about sort of investing towards future action. And I can't find it on our page, but in Calgary, they've costed out that if you take transit, it costs the city 0.67, uh, like 67 cents a kilometer. Uh, that's, that is the cost to both you as an individual for your ticket and also the cost to society for driving. It's, it's more than double. It's, it's uh, a buck 25 a kilometer. So, um, I'm wondering, like, I'm looking, we're at 1.1 1, 1. 1 million. We are make, adjusting a budget here that's going to take us to, it's realistic that we'll be at 1.25 million sooner than we think. And are we investing enough in transit, for instance, to save us money on other uh, comparisons? Like, I know we have this mass transit plan that's supposed to come into effect when we're at 1.25 million. But I'm wondering, like, if we do not invest now, are we compounding pain four years from now. That's what I'm trying to get an understanding of. And if we've costed out some of these like core cost saving functions, does that make sense? It does. I mean, I'll start at a high level and then I'll maybe ask others to chime in. I think when we build our budgets, we're balancing two things, the fiscal realities and the money available to us against the city plan and the fact that it might be coming a little faster than we think it is. So I think it's probably fair to say that there, we're gonna experience some of those demands earlier. I'm just, I'm not sure. I still have to balance that with the funding available. Of course, yeah, okay, so maybe that's a separate conversation. I was also trying to, one of the other big city moves we made was we passed zoning bylaw renewal and we're um, working towards a substantial completion plan. Can finance help me if we did not do ZBR over the next four years, how much higher would taxes be? Say it one more time. If we if did we not didn't. do ZBR, Zone of Bala Renewal, how much higher would taxes be? Like if we, if we want to grow within our boundary uh, and within our means, if we do not do that, if we just... If we continue to grow if the we continue older to scroll, way and more not services, become yeah, dense. Yeah, yeah. I don't... I don't I, I know we have some studies on that. I don't know that I have the number of exactly what that would make I taxes can, I think higher. Kim would, no? Yeah, um, so we have, uh, through the city plan technical study that was done, um, the business as usual approach um, versus a more compact uh, development form with a more focus of infill creates um, an 8% uh, benefit in terms of a reduction in, in net tax levy. Wow. Uh, that, and is that 8% year over year, or is that at once we reach city plan of 2050? Once we reach city plan with two, population 2 million. Okay, so we're moving in that direction. We wouldn't realize, it makes sense, I guess, we haven't added the growth in the boundary yet, yeah. Um, I wanted to confirm, so we're spending... Yeah, so uh, Chief McPhee has often said that 30% of the um, calls for service are social work calls for the police. I believe in the fire department, Chief Joe, I think, and the administration have said that 70% of the calls are for uh, health-related services. If we were able to bill back to the province very quickly, I think that's a, if they covered those costs, the 30% for social, the 70% for policing, my math says it's about a 12% tax reduction. Um, have we done this for other exercises of city services where like if they paid for Explore because Explore is essentially ECDEV, if they paid for these other, if we truly rendered unto Caesars that which is Smith's, how much would, like do we, do we have a sense of that in the budget? 
No, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say like we're not cognizant of those things. We know that you need to undertake advocacy strategies to try and shift expenses to where we think those expenses should be. But if you're asking me if I've like quantified the amount, we've done, in the past we've quantified downloading, but we haven't done it as an immediate exercise. We'll get to some of that in the mayor's motion that he had made, um, which we'll work on next year. Okay, that would be really helpful because I'm responding to constituents about like, why is my, my taxes this much out in Sturgeon County, but then it's this much in Edmonton? And and if we could quantify that, that's great. Um, I'm out of time, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Okay, I think that was it for that round. And uh, Councillor Prince, may? I'll take the chair. I wanna start where I was left off, Andre. I'm really struggling that we have chronically underfunded core services like Snow and Ice. I'm glad I'm, we're catching up on that, which is decision that this council made to catch up with the reductions that started in 2018. When was the last time that we made significant investments in the bus service, other than making some changes to off-peak service, and making the on-demand permanent. Yeah, I think the last significant investment would have been the on-demand. Um, I think the, the premise of the network service design was to reallocate the services in a more efficient way for the city and, and, and building on the city plan and being ready for that. Um, in the interim, uh, that was the intent of, of what city plan looked like and then we would grow services once we have a base that we could uh, build upon. I think. I'll just turn it over to Carrie uh, if there's anything else she wants to add there. I would just say for the conventional bus network, Mayor, and it was 2014, 2015 uh, budget cycle when hours were added to the network. Yeah, here, here we are in 2023, and I hear this similar thing, maybe not cuts, but on uh, turf maintenance, right? Again, underfunded, not meeting standards. Uh, and uh, yes, dollars and cents meant 7% absolutely seems very high, right? But I'm just trying to understand when, and I understand the pressure that you are under and, and like your, this budget is built to deal, con contain cost, I understand that, right? But I am kind of not, I, I'm gonna use my words carefully, but it's kind of frustrating in a way that uh, the services that we are supposed to be providing we are unable to invest into those services to the level that citizens expect or our standards demand, right? So yeah. just trying to understand how do we how do we balance that, right? That uh, when I look at the survey, there's a trend that people are seeing the dissatisfaction yeah. in the core services. Yeah, so I, I guess what I would say is that we have building blocks for your budget. Um, one of them is satisfaction surveys and engagement with Edmontonians. That's, that's one of the nine building blocks. The other building blocks include, you know, the vision, the confirmed priorities with council, understanding economic and social context, uh, which includes, you know, trying to figure out what is the acceptable tax levy and what the affordability issues are. There's workforce impacts, there's carbon impacts, there's priority-based budgeting, integrated corporate insights, and then, you know, the needs of boards and commissions that don't often come up in some of the satisfaction surveys. So I think what you see is the same tension we see, which mm. is that if we were to, instructed by council to base our budget on satisfaction only, it would be a very different budget, yeah. I would suggest. I think the other thing, as and, and you asked about some of the negative comments that you heard in the survey, there are also positive comments yes, in I the understand. survey. So yeah. if, you, if, if we focus on just the negative, then that will drive us in a way. Yeah. But many of those uh, surveys also talk about there's a there's not a, a ninety percent perspective on something, and I think a good example is on fire service. It's up in the high nineties in terms of favorable, from a, a, and waste collection is up quite high yeah. at sixty seven yeah. seven. But some of the things we mentioned, like infrastructure delivery, transit, they're kind of at the thirty six to forty percent favorable. So there's a there's another group who say they're okay with it, and so. I think you just have, you, you can't just look at the negative comments in the survey, you've got to look at both negative and yeah. positive. And when something's trending down at a 
a low favorable of 20%, then I think that's an area where we need to invest in, and I think we have made yeah. those kind of decisions. So that's yeah. that's the that's the, the rub. No, and, and I, I understand that, and thank you for sharing that, that perspective, because I think there are certain services that are people are very satisfied with, right? Rec, rec services, rec centers, for example, uh, fire service, people are very satisfied. But I'm seeing a trend here. Trend is that some core services like public transit, snow and ice, turf maintenance, and that is our, our own reports are also suggesting that we are not meeting the standards. Yeah, and I would say when, when that started to happen, that we went into to those decisions, they were be before me, but some of those decisions were made with eyes wide open, and that's what happens when you get 0% budgets in yeah. several years, you're gonna have an impact on the service. And it's an impact that you don't necessarily recover from within a year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would say that the advice on what the impacts of those kind of budgets w was provided at the time, and, and that's what we're partially, that's partially the reason we're in in the circumstance that you've described, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll move the additional round. Second. Second. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, who do I pick? <laughs> I picked you last. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go with Councillor Rutherford. Northside oh, did Solidarity. you say? It's his birthday. It's his birthday. Oh, he was first, so I let him do it first, so. Yes. <laughs> so moved by Mayor Soli, seconded by Councillor Rutherford. Please vote on the next round. <laughs>
Okay, other question. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go to one of my other questions prepared. Um, and I think I can ask this in public about our process as far as um, negotiations with our union partners. So council is provided information based on um, sort of how negotiations are going, what the economic climate is, and at that point in that information, there's recommendations as to whether or not we should set a, a mandate for, um, for sort of sort of what our what our limit might be um, for those negotiations. Is that correct? Uh, sometimes, Councillor, the updates are simply just updates on, on the work that we're doing. We don't seek a mandate uh, decision at every meeting. Okay, okay. And, and again, we take that, you know, from the, the expert advice of the negotiators, um, um, our economic updates and that. Okay, so, and then from there, negotiation continues on, right? Okay, and then we are brought back, perhaps whether it's arbitrated or a final negotiation settlement that's been agreed upon, that's, we received that back at council for approval. Correct. Correct, okay. So our, our input into the actual negotiations as councillors is pretty well removed? No, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I'm going to send this over to Michelle Dorval. But okay. when we do provide updates, we do look to to council for feedback. Uh, so it, you know, at those points, we're not looking for a decision on a mandate, but we do we do give you updates in order to make sure that you're uh, well apprised of, of kind of where we're at and and get your feedback. So okay. I don't know if Michelle, if you have anything to add. And at that point, if we wanted to provide any additional parameters or whatever for negotiations, we can. Absolutely, and, and maybe I'll just uh, jump in here, Councillor, because I think there's one other. I mean, many of the councillors meet with the unions directly as well during yeah. all this. I think that's just another input because you, uh, when you meet with the unions directly and in private, you get a perspective from each of those. And I think it's just an input that you can bring to when we give you an update and presentation. And we often get questions from councillors uh, about questions they've that that you know the union has asked you directly. And so I think it's an important other input. Uh, that you're armed with as you consider mandates. Okay. And I think, Michelle, my time is up, but did you have something to add? No, you can come back. Okay. Come back for next round. Thank you. Okay. All right. Councillor Prince I'll take the chair. I just want to go more a little bit into uh, onto, uh, the audit that was done uh, on the employee to supervisor uh, ratio and there was some good work done in in that their area because you took the recommendations to you took, you took and you started working on uh, making sure that there was a lot that there was in that recommendation work. can you speak a little bit more to that Andre then I'll go to my next question so yeah I, I would say mayor generally as I briefed the other day that um, council had asked the auditor to do an audit on on the level of management uh, because it was sort of increasing at a certain point in time uh, and the auditor made recommendations city had, uh, accepted all those recommendations and then went about implementing the recommendations which included a lot of reductions in management staff and i'll have the numbers in front of me but we they're they're very clear yeah. i think the important thing is the auditor then came back uh, i think it was either late in the last administration or early in this council to, to confirm that that those had been implemented to the satisfaction of the audit, auditor then since then we've had the op I, I think there's some things that i started to do as the city manager uh, before op12 that started us to move down a road of of um well we also have been collaborating with the jurisdictional scan which took people out of opted out and management positions and put them into union positions so there was more reductions of management there then there were some early decisions i made as city manager and then op12 was the next piece and and we've briefed uh, several yeah. times on what those have resulted in yeah. and then like I said yesterday we'll continue to do this from time to time uh, I think it's important we look at the speed at which we do it um, because yeah. if you want to do it quickly you got to pay severance for managers and opt it out yeah. if you want to do it by attrition it doesn't cost you anything but it takes a little more time yeah 
I also noticed that certain departments, uh, the, the employee to supervisor ratio varies from department to department, right? Yeah, that's and, correct. And because uh, of the nature of the work. It's yes, good. okay. Like so if you have transit with lots of shift work, there's a, a much higher ratio in terms of managers with a lot more employees. Um, but it, yes, if, if you're doing other complicated work, uh, particularly, I would say in IIS yeah. and UPE, there's there's yeah. a different ratio because of the different nature of the work. Yeah, I, I noticed think this that is also yeah. reflected in why the ratios at the GOA are much higher because there's a lot more policy work done at the GOA. I think I mentioned yesterday they're at a seven seventeen percent, which is a lot higher than us, but they also do a lot of you know policy work and government yeah. work as opposed to operational work like we yeah. do. So. Yeah, I would like to uh, understand better in the IIS and and the. And the urban planning, sorry, uh, that's what it is, right? Yeah, uh, uh, urban planning economy. And not this is not. I just want to understand. Like I don't know. Like I just would like to. Uh, I don't know what the mechanism be for having that kind of conversation. Uh, is part of education as well, right? For yeah. uh, you know, if uh, urban planning has more planners, right? Because that's their work. Then uh, you know, uh, uh, they may not be front facing, right? Uh, uh, or in IIS, you have more engineers, project managers, and all that, right? So I just want to understand, what does the mechanism be for, for us? I believe the mechanism is, is OP12, okay. and I've briefed council several times on some of the work that UPE and IIS are doing in that area from an OP12 perspective. And then I think the other mechanisms are um, the jurisdictional review that's going on, because we're making big changes every time we go through a department on, on the jurisdictional scan, which, which generally... Uh, gets opted out and managers into union positions. I think the other thing to understand is uh, reducing managers or having uh, folks go into the union doesn't mean we're paying less money. So there are circumstances where unionized employees are, we're, we're paying them more money than a manager over the year. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot to do with the collective bargaining agreement, which we respect, and the fact that uh, they do overtime and, and should get that. And I'm not, it's not a positive or negative comment. It's just the fact that there, there's sometimes an assumption that the, that the opted out managers get paid more. That's mm -hmm. just not always yeah. necessarily a comparison. So for example, um, I think in IAS, Project. We have engineer project managers and we have uh, unionized project managers and um, yeah. pay is not always equitable. Okay. No, I, I absolutely value and understand the role that managers and supervisors play very critical for well-functioning organizations. So I'm not anyway undermining or undervaluing that work. I just want to increase my understanding and knowledge uh, about uh, so that I am more prepared to answer questions from public about uh, the effect effectiveness of the yeah. organization. And again, mechanisms OP12, we're happy to come back with more of that as we do continue to do more work. Got it. Okay. Uh, I will take the chair back. Uh, go to Consta Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just wanted to pick up on uh, some of the questions that were asked around uh, the challenges we're experiencing in investing in core services to um, a level that Edmontonians expect. and. Yeah, I guess just looking looking for some additional feedback from administration because, I mean, in my mind, it's not an issue that's just sort of popped up out of nowhere. It's it's sort of a consequence of a few things, and I see one of the consequences being, um, well, our systemic growth patterns spreading ourselves quite thin. That's over a matter of decades, and we're trying to course correct through city plan. But then the other piece of that would be several years of zero or near zero tax increases. So. I guess was it was it known that like we eventually would have to pick up those pieces? We'd eventually have to play a bit of catch up. I'm looking for some thoughts there. Um, I think it, it was known in the same way that I briefed yesterday, Councillor, that you know we've absorbed 26 million into our budget, and we're gonna we're doing that because we we think it's important to work hard to bring the tax levy down. Um, but like I said yesterday, if you do that too often, too long, it eventually erodes services because I'm asking people to do more with no more money. Um, and in, partly that is good because it drives efficiency in the organization. But if you do it for too long, too often, then it reduces core service. And I think that's what we saw happen in particular with snow and ice control. We, 
went through a couple of low budgets, went through that 0% budget, did what we could, and you know definitely saw the, the, the service reduced. So I think it's a bit of a balance. Um, but I, you know, part of me is good with that because it does drive efficiency. Because uh, until you have to do something, you know, you may not always find those efficiencies. I think it's what is the right balance. But I do think we go into it eyes wide open, and that's one of the reasons I said yesterday that, you know, well, I think I'm confident we can do that this year. But if we do it too often, too more, it, it could erode services. Yeah, absolutely, and totally, totally agree uh, around driving efficiencies and, and continually improving on that front. Um, and this is where it gets interesting because it, it does intersect with the way that we grow as a city. And when I think about snow and ice in particular, I mean, adding adding more linear kilometers of roadway has an impact as well. Um, yeah, and I guess this, this also brings up just the question around... Um, around infrastructure deficit and I mean to, to Mr. Lachlan, I mean there's of course a, a full a full attachment in the report around um, trying to implement strategies to, to, to close that gap. Um, I mean it, things are obviously very tight. Where, where, where are your thoughts right now? <laughs> and I know that's a, a very challenging question but are there, are there interim ways that we can start to close that gap? Well, I have a bit of a biased thought because of course, yep. we are responsible for the life cycle management of the assets of the city of Edmonton. And what I would say is we're underfunded, point blank. Yeah. Um, and we've gone through cycles of this. And I applaud previous councils over uh, 29 to 2012 budget, the 2015 to 18, and the last budget, there was a there was a significant investment in renewal that actually addressed some of that gap. Uh, but prior to that, uh, we were responding to decisions that were made, and um, understand at the time those decisions were required based on affordability. Uh, but it compounded to a point where. Um, we had a significant deficit when it came to care of our assets. Um, so, so a method to close the gap, which is something that we've shared previously and is in the report, is to create dedicated, reliable funding that goes to ensuring that you're caring for those assets. Uh, uh, the Neighborhood Renewal Program has been very successful um, to, to, to accomplish that. I'm hoping that the Alley Renewal Program will be doing the same. Um, but that is a method to do that. But I will echo Stacy in saying there's an affordability component to that. For sure. What I will caution, and this happened in a previous budget cycle, is we will hit a point where potholes will reach a point where uh, each of you will receive calls from residents related to too many potholes. What are we going to do about it? I predict that will happen in this budget cycle. There will be facilities that we will have to uh, duct tape and binder twine and and adjust to make sure that we're keeping them operational that that will continue to happen um, because Not only are we underfunded we have a plethora of assets that mm -hmm. we need to maintain as a city Sorry, I'm, I, I'm out of time. Thank you so much. There, but, thank you. Yeah, but thank, that's the thank situation. Thank you, Councillor Ice. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm sorry if I'm asking some like the tough questions here and based on the budget uh, proposed adjustments. So my next question is about community recreation and culture. So the expenditure increases is budgeted $3.4 million and increase for 2024, but no increase for 2025 and 2026. So I just want uh, get a sense what's the rationale for this increased expenditures. So I'm going to start and then look to see if Mr. Jevney's online. I believe this is increase in attendance and demand at the recreation centers. So you have higher revenue, but you also need more expenditures to operate. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And it's really the lifeguards and security guards, but it goes into the base budget, Councillor. That's why we only need the increase in the one year. Uh, then my question, and on behalf of my constituents, uh, is um, 
one hand, we heard uh, for our recre uh, rec recreation center facilities use, just get back um, to the normal, normal or pre COVID-19 and for the, for the people to use this facility. And if that is the case, the revenue listed here and is, is not additional revenue, it's just to get back to the level and in the pre-COVID. And if that is the case, what is the needs assessment or anything there instead of say, oh, because revenue increase, we need more. Uh, for the expenses. And because generally speaking, revenue increase does not mean the expenses need to increase as well. So I, I just want to get a very clear understanding and for this increase to be budgeted and in 2024. Hey, Councilor, these are dollars that we're spending now and, and we're funding it through the revenue variance that we have. So these are the, the lifeguards we need to open the pools and have people in at the level that we want to. Additional security guards to make sure this facility stays safe and secure. So while our revenues are going up, our expenses are also going up and we're just adjusting both lines to make sure that we're properly budgeting for them. Oh, uh, safe, safe, safety is important for our Edmontonians, no doubt for that. And then $3.4 million is total for the safeguards or is there any other, what is covered under this $3.4 million? for the expenditures? It's, it's predominantly lifeguards and security guards across all of our facilities. Like how many were planning to hire? I'm not sure how many. There, there's staff, as I said, there are staff that we're currently deploying, uh, but we don't have a budget, operating budget for it. We're, we're funding it through the access to revenues that we currently have. So there is no number identified under this budget. So it's just estimated, the number. No, the number is, I think, 3.4, and that's based on our actual expenditures. So as they operate recreation facilities, they we take in revenue and we have expenses. And as the demand increases, we increase expenditures to meet that demand. And but I don't like Mr. Jevney, I think part of it would also okay. be like if you didn't increase the expenditures, we wouldn't necessarily see the revenue increases, right? Like you're responding to it. Um, that, that's right. We would have to cap the participation in the pool. And we've had to do that at times where we have people lined uh, up waiting yeah. to get into the pool. And we're certainly I'm, worried about. I'm sorry. You know, I have so one minute. Safe, but that does impact revenue over time. I'm sorry. I have to mind, mind for my time. To me, this is not make any sense because it's not, if you already include, uh, expenditure already in, uh, increased and in the 2023, and where is that the money from? The yeah, we're over, over expending now and offsetting it with the revenue that we're also over our budget targets. But this revenue right now, last here is not for the 2023, it's for the 2024. So let me, let me just, yeah. I'll try this way. The trend in recreation centers is that there are more people using them and it's generating more revenue. And we're responding to that by ensuring that we can maintain the service levels at the recreation centers and not have to remove people from the pool, which would then have a, another on an issue, a uh, service impact. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I, I know my time is out, but this is different from yep. what I heard from the people who actually use the Constant, facilities. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Always next round, right? So, yeah. Uh, if need to ask more questions, right? So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, I think Councillor Wright has questions, right? And you can sign up. So, go ahead, please. Yeah. Do we need a. No, no, you are still. No, no, we, no the, you are still into the oh, am I? approved round. Okay, yeah. okay, awesome. Um, okay, I've got one final question on behalf of my constituents, um, and that's in regards to the traffic safety. Um, I, I see that um, in in the the what we heard report or whatever traffic safety is a, is considered a strength, but I think. The ward I represent um, is concerned about the community safety, bylaw enforcement, and that is a, that's on a, a, the opportunity side of the slide. I'm also thinking about, as a, a secondary, um, revenue generation to help pay for some of these things. 
So my question is in regards to um, the TASER program. I'm just wondering, have we heard anything whether the moratorium um, is going to be lifted December 1st? Um, any insight from the province on that? No, Councillor. Nothing? No, not as of yet. Okay. And I, I believe I have a call next week with someone at transportation to talk, talk about it. Okay. Um, because I, I'm looking at the, um, the map, whoops, where it is, um, the safe streets map, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot that, there's not, not a whole lot of automated enforcement or, or speed enforcement um, in, the, in that southeast zone. And so until we have that moratorium lifted, we can't even consider putting any any automated enforcement in there? That's correct. Okay. Um, so then what's our other option? T to, to monitor patrol um, traffic safety in, that neighbor in the neighborhoods. We have no other options? Well, we certainly have programs around um, putting out speed radar um, trailers. Uh, obviously, there's EPS and other options like that, um, but there's not a lot of options on the automated enforcement side other than getting the morning tour. And it. how effective are those um, those speed trailers? So is, is there any any stats kept? Does that, does that slow people down? I can turn that over to Craig. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also add to, to what Eddie mentioned. Um, in terms of options, we also have our street labs um, <laughs> in that programs. Um, reopening again, uh, and so things like curb extensions, uh, curb cuts. Um, there's things that we can do in terms of like adaptable infrastructure. Um, but it, but Eddie's right in terms of new locations for automated enforcement. That's that's not um, that's not an option until the moratorium is lifted. So um, on in terms of the, yeah. on 17th Street in the past year, we have had five fatalities. One of them being a 71 year old senior grandfather. What do I tell the people in Wards Matapi that what we're doing to ensure their safety? I don't think a street lab's gonna cut it. Okay, thank you. There we go. Next, uh, Councillor Prince, can you take the chair? Sure, please? I'll take the chair. I want to start with the presentation that was made yesterday morning, slide one, that talks about approved 2023-2026 operating budget plus fall SOBA. The first column is maintain existing services. For 2024, the tax levy increases 3.8%. Is that corporates, like does that include maintaining services for agencies as well, or just the what is under Andre's authority under uh, in, in our court, in, within the corporation? I think it's, it does include ABC. So it it's, does? it's the cost of maintaining all of the entities that are within the budget that need maintenance on the on the overall budget. With the exception of EPS, we've pulled that one down. I see, okay. So for example, base budget for public libraries, right? What, yes. Whatever is required to maintain that base budget is within that 3.8%. Yes, any adjustments that we've made to those budgets yeah. that are just basic maintenance Got would it. be within that line item. And council directed 0.3%, I know what that is, but I can get that offline growth on existing services. Is that council directed? Is just kind of a UC, uh, how's that uh, kind of figured out? Explain me that. So for council directed, we have items in there that were approved. No, I'm, I'm going to the next one, okay. growth on existing services. 
So for growth on existing services, what's included in that is on-demand permanent funding that was approved, safety service evaluation, agile corporate security services, uh, the 2025 election costs, as okay. well as the two anti-racism packages. So some are council directed, some are within the, decided within the corporation, okay. Yeah, most of the, those are things that were approved as part of last year's budget as I well. I see, okay. And operating impact of capital, is that uh, Blatchford to, uh, Nate to Blatchford, LRT? That one is included in there, but there's also operating impacts of capital relating to the River Valley Park, to the bike plan implementation acceleration, uh, snow storage upgrades. Um, but the biggest contributors at this for the new ones are the Blatchford to Metro, uh, or the Metro to Blatchford and the ETS auxiliary vehicles growth units, as well as the network operations for OCT and Tweedlewall. Got it. Okay. And I want to dig more deeper into the Edmonton Police Service, 1.6% tax levy increase, part of 7.09, right? So that includes the, the formula, the cost of the funding formula that we approved, right? Is that, that but that's not entire 1.6%. Then the other component is the settlement? That's correct. So both are in, in there. I want to go back to this, another more detailed slide on, on EPS that I just want to understand better. I'm going to go, here it is, uh, I can't, there's no number on it, but it talked about Edmonton Police Service funding. On the right hand side, it talks about uh, uh, provincial funding, which I understand, uh, no questions on that. $2.9 million for healthy uh, streets operation that was we already approved. I understand that 19.7 million for salaries. Is that a new is that funded through 7.09 or is it funded through maybe it's a tricky question <laughs> through whatever was approved as part of uh, the mandate. Is this additional to what was approved with mandate? So when we approved the 4.96% salaries our budget last year yeah there was a portion of that 19.7 already included in the budget because we had included it in you know we, we'd set money aside but there wasn't quite enough so we had to top it up so if you look at those two arrows that are going across yeah 18.4 million was included in the 4.96 percent that council approved oh. in last december the addition the 16 million dollars was what we needed over and above for the salary settlement as well as the funding formula in order to get to the, the, the current 7.09%. So what makes 1.6%? What make both of them combined? Both make of them combined, so the, the funding formula as well as the salary settlement. Oh, I see, so 18.4, part of that, okay, we, because you took, out of, took that part out of the uh, maintaining services or the first part that I talked about earlier on, the cost of, uh, uh, sustaining services, so ICO. So you you separated that both for the for EPS. Yeah, we okay. we did it entirely. We didn't put the maintaining services yeah. in there. We separated them out completely. So their maintenance of services is in their line item. I see. So sixteen plus eighteen point four comes to one point six percent. Correct. Okay, got it. That is. Oh, I'm out of. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Out of time. That's okay. I liked your line of questioning. That's why I let you go. No, oh, no okay. I'm joking. I, sorry. I'll pass the chair back. Uh, actually, I will, like I, move? I will move, I'll move the move additional the round. Second. Okay, I'll, I'll take the second from uh, Councillor Nack. Please vote on the next round. Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. I'll pass the chair back. Okay. I have the chair now. Uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. So uh, I want to move to <clears throat> the operating impacts of capital. For the um, first question related to the Metro to uh, Bradford, 
as an alternative. So I want to get information, and I recall this year, we actually approved some funding and from um, like Nate and the two Brach, uh, Brachford. And so this additional and $2.4 million and then listed um, under three category, um, I would like to get more information on this, what it is about this increase expenses requested. I could probably provide the answer to that. So we'll be extending services from the current Nate station, which is a four car platform to the new uh, Nate station that will be opening, I think Adam said Q1 of 2024. And that expansion of that service is extending the line to that new station. And, discon and, and we're um, discontinuing the current Nate station. Because there's three category and all those increases uh, expenditures um, is not clear to me. Like for example, community standards and neighborhoods. What does that mean? So this is an integrated service package. So what you're seeing in each of those line items is the adjustments made to the individual budgets associated with that. So you're, you're asking... Yeah, what does that specific uh, spending uh, will refract? And how this uh, community standards and the neighborhoods is under the Metro to Bradford? I can help with that. Uh, so what you're looking at are the costs of the support positions uh, that are involved in providing support for that. So that would be the transit peace officer component. Um, so the different operational costs, we have the operator piece, electricity, uh, we have the auxiliary fleet, safety and security, maintenance of the technology, and then some parks and roads infrastructure maintenance costs, like the street lights, snow removal, uh, and landscaping. But it's my understanding, or we already have that cost covered, and then in the existing budget. And the so the, these are the incremental changes in costs. So this is the difference going to this uh, permanent station. It has a different um, kind of physical setup requiring these additional components uh, uh, that are outlined in the service package. So for this permanent station, and when this permanent station will be open, and more specifically and for the um, construction will be happening. So I think Adam, you had mentioned it earlier. Yeah, quarter one of next year. So it is, is not about the new uh, station and in the Bradford? Because the new station in the Bradford even st not started yet. So there was a report that went to executive committee which basically identified two options. One to run the service to uh, the second station in Blatchford and one option to run the uh, service to the new Nate station. Uh, and from that discussion, there was guidance provided by executive committee that, that there was a preference and administration shared that, that the service should go to the new Nate station. Uh, the incremental costs to do that are is what is reflected in the operating impacts of capital. In the future, uh, and this will be a timing question related to the development of Blatchford, there will be an additional operating impact of capital that will be a result to go to the second station. Okay. Timing undefined. Okay, thank, thank you. So my next question is about the uh, Edmonton uh, Transit Service, another $1.4 million expenditure inc increase. Can you provide more information on that? Are you talking about the auxiliary growth vehicles? Uh, the vehicle growth units, yes. Yes, so we took over the service for from EPCOR on the servicing of all the catenary equipment on, on uh, the LRT. Uh, they were discontinuing that service. So that is the operational cost of onboarding the new um, vehicles for that service itself. Uh, so what's the reason and why we need to take that over and from ABCO is not ABCO cannot continue to provide that services? A Apple because this is create, yeah, create a lesser 0 0.7 tax increase. That's correct. So they cannot continue to? They decided to con discontinue that service. Then that is, a, is our mandatory to provide? We, 
yes, this for safety purposes, it's our obligation to make sure that we're maintaining the catenary of the LRT. So who did who had who has the authority to decide it? The services should be continue or not continue under the app call. Well, they say we do not want to continue, and yeah. then back to the city. Oh, Got so how, is there any more information could provide it on that? I know that my time is up. Time is up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we will take a break here for lunch, and we will be back at one thirty. And there are some. Uh, uh, I think council council members may have some questions that that would require us to. I know one councilor has some questions that may require us to in, in camera, right? But we will do that uh, after we conclude public questions. Uh, we will be back at one thirty. Until then, we are on recess. Have good lunch.
We're live from Council Chamber. Okay. All right, we are back and would like to call this meeting back to order. Do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Princefield. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Uh, let's see, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette and Councillor Hamilton are away uh, at FCM representing the city. So they will be joining us off and on. Uh, Councillor Tang. Uh, good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Oh, and good afternoon. Oh, there you are. Okay, Councillor Hamilton's there. Uh, Councillor uh, Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. All right. So we were on. There were. I saw list. No, I thought there was a list of speakers. Oh, this morning. Yeah, so we're the, ready to move the next round of speakers and go from there. I'll move the next round of speakers. Okay. Or second. I I I do. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see anybody's name on the board, so I was like, why? Final question. <laughs> So there's a motion moved by Councillor Knack, seconded by Councillor Cardwell. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Jennifer, uh, Councillor Rice, you want to go first? Oh, no. I, I just got to go through some more. No, I already asked. Oh, you did? Oh, but I'm... This is for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, on the presentation, again, right? So, explain me a bit more. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, highlight, you touched a bit around uh, efforts that you took on uh, on uh, the twenty-six million dollar reallocation, right? Or oh, not reallocation? Absorbing. I don't know what term you use, right? <laughs> absorbing twenty-six million dollars within the existing budget to deal with some of the pressures. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mayor. Yeah, so we, what we did when we, you know, we're looking at solving this issue and bringing the budget together is we wanted to, whether absorb or, um, you know, deal with is the right term. We wanted to not add everything we could and try to do what we could from an efficiency perspective as we started to see some of these costs increase. So we think that we've been able to do that with $26 million worth of items. 4.8 million are, are really working hard to um, sort of absorb the inflation of parts, uh, working hard to make sure $1.2 million worth of contracts don't get uh, spent. 
uh, trying other ways to deal uh, with uh, vandalism costs. Um, and then that's in the fleet and facility services and parks and roads. Uh, we, we think we can do try, try to absorb 7.5 million for open spaces and inventory growth, 6.6 .6 million in roadways inventory growth. So those are new places we have to manage, but we're mm -hmm. going to be doing it with the same staff we have now. Um, and then 3.4 million for safety and security improvements, and that's a one-time piece. So that was our effort to try to do as much as we could yeah. uh, within our means. And like I've said before, if we do that for a year, we're, we, we can handle it. There'll be some impacts, but if we do it consistently forever, then yeah, it's going to result in an overall service decrease as we've seen in snow and ice control yeah. in the years where we went zero. So we're trying to do, yeah. and, and what I'm trying to do by by driving that direction is achieve as many efficiencies in those specific areas as we can try to, to, to find. Yeah. So how does that impact OP12 commitments? Because, uh, you know, $60 million, $15 million each, four years, then $240 million are reallocations. The more you're kind of trying to manage within the existing budget, all these pressures that are being yeah, I, right? I think generally just makes it easier or harder, <laughs> easier, <laughs> harder because you know as you've seen we we have worked hard to cut the 15 million yeah. and uh, we're not 100 percent there. Yeah. As part of that overall 60 million, we've 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 worked hard. We did the first 15 million, and I'm confident we can get that. This is an additional 26 million, and then we've offered up some other OP12 ideas, um, mm -hmm. depending on how budget amendments go over the next couple of days could take more flexibility away. If some of those budget ideas that were for the 240 actually go to reducing, mm -hmm. those will be even more. So it, it's just more and more pressure, which, which is fine. We'll do our best to, to implement those. Um, but, but I would say we're getting to that point now with the 60 million we've reduced for in OP12 with um, the 26 million here. If we get other pressures, then, you know, it just becomes harder and harder as you right. accumulate all those pressures. Right. Um, and then I would say that um, I think we can move soon and you can make some decisions as part of this budget cycle that are related to OP12 because we've tried to show you what OP12 opportunities we have this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't make them uh, as part of budget, we can certainly come back and revisit those in January. So we'll continue okay. to do that. Yeah. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that commitment, right? And I, I just want to make sure that we are being transparent in a way that uh, by asking you to continue to do more and more and more at the same time have expectations that we set earlier, right? So I think just trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, and, and we're gonna try to help track that for you and show it. So yeah. for example, if there are budget amendments that come forward this week that we've put forward as OP12, we'll, we'll certainly implement them as budget amendments, but I, I will plan on counting those towards okay, the OP12. You're gonna, you're gonna keep track of um, and and I, I think but in order to, for us to count them towards OP12, that 240 has to be a transition, right? Not not a cut. So, mm, okay, got it. Okay. Unless you want to change that. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, I'm out of time. Uh, I will take the chair back. I'll return and, the chair. Yeah, Councilor Stevenson. Very briefly, the um, I I have a, a community group or a, a business association that has some federal funding. Uh, they require some match funding to not lose that federal funding. Um, but I think this sort of falls outside the, the regular budgetary process. Just wanted to understand in terms of the council contingency that exists right now, um, if we sort of leave it as is as part of these budget deliberations, is it still possible to make motions related to that as a funding source uh, at our next council meeting, for example? Yeah, council contingency, you're free to make motions against until the funding no longer, until the funding's depleted. Okay, okay, well that's great. I think that might streamline these conversations and I'll uh, be sure to follow up with more information from my colleagues, thank you. Thank you so much. So that concludes the questions, and I think there's a desire to go. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rice. So from yester, uh, yesterday morning's presentation, and then on page two, the public one, specific talk about maintain existing services. The tax rate is 3.8, and then for all the increase in the down here. So then my question is, 
does that mean, does this table mean right now for us to maintain all the existing services, we only need like 3.8% tax? That's in the table. So I would say you would, to maintain what you currently have, you need the 3.8 and the 1.6 um, for police because that's also mm -hmm. maintaining services. We've just carved out police. But, and, and so that's what we need to maintain. And the rest of these things are things you would have to agree to not do. Then my confusing is, if we have 43 salary sediments, but right now we only refract the police salary sediment, well, where is the rest of sediment absorbed in the budget? So we are what, getting very the close rest? to needing to go into private, but oh, okay. they are in, okay. I make sure. estimates, it's in maintained services. Um, Okay, so another public question is about, because for this winter, we don't have almost two months snow removal for that cast. Where is that money right now for this year's, for that snow snow removal so, so far? Are you saying like yeah. it hasn't snowed yet? Yeah, yeah. I'll get uh, Mr. McEwen to answer that. Yeah, so we've been fortunate with some unseasonably warm weather. Um, we've got a number of permanent uh, permanent and seasonal staff in the snow and ice team. Um, what we've been doing to date so far is redeploying those staff uh, to other priority areas, completing um, uh, you know, uh, required maintenance work, filling more potholes, graffiti, other priority items, litter pickup, assisting with encampment cleanup, um, in anticipation of needing those staff as soon as it starts to snow again. So, so we are still saving money on contract costs, um, which is a benefit. So of those areas where we do contract out work, we're not having to do those contractor callouts. Um, that'll be in, uh, you know, if it continues to stay warm as it is, hopefully until the end of the year, we'll see, you know, in the order of, of uh, the low million dollar type uh, order of magnitude. Um, but right now we're leveraging all of our staff to, uh, to complete other priority uh, mandated work. Uh, do you have that estate number and how much money right now we are not used for the snow move because we don't have snow? So that will show up in the operating financial update. And because it's a this year thing, it mm -hmm. will just lower the projected deficit. But that deficit, uh, I just want to get that number. Do, we, do you have that data? You don't? It's not, it's not fully compiled yet. Because that will provide some information. If we're going to lower the deficit, that means the, the balance between the revenue and the expenses will change. So I just it want to find It doesn't have anything to do with the budget as presented today. This, when I say. But I want amendment something. That, that is why I need that information. So you would need to amend on an ongoing basis to reduce snow. If we have a savings in snow and ice because it snows less, it is one-time money, and it will go to reduce the deficit in the year it occurs, which is 2023. And so that money isn't available. It, it will go to the FSR. Uh, how much F FSR balance right now we have? The FSR balance right now is 135.7 million. So it's beyond the minimum right now? That number doesn't contemplate the deficit because we wouldn't take it out until the end of the year. Okay, I, I may have more questions, but I'm not going to ask right now. And because for those numbers right now, um, based on math I'm doing on my paper is not matching to each other. But I will, I will follow up later on. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. I, I, so I, just, I was wondering about the surplus. You said it goes to FSR. In case it snows every day from January 1st to April 30th, can we draw on that FSR if there's not enough money for snow? So you have a financial stabilization reserve that's minimum balance is 5% of uh, like basically two months worth of expenditures is I think what it works out to be. 
you're sitting at 135 right now. That is without accounting for the 2023 deficit, which we anticipate will be $50 million. Okay. So now you've drawn it below the minimum. If snow and I, if it snows every day, it's going to generate another deficit in the next year. It's going to make the FSR even lower, and your policy is going to kick in and require you to replenish to the minimum within three years. So it's not like we got an extra bundle of cash sitting somewhere from it not snowing for the past two months. It, it, you I have mean, a little it bit of savings yeah. that yeah. is going to offset the already existing deficit. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think it's important to understand, Councillor, that we, you know, we save some money on the contracts because we're not yeah. calling those up. We save probably a bit of money on fuel, but we also don't want to lay off all those employees just waiting for it to snow because they're ready and they could do really good work and catch up with some of the, you know, stuff from the, the summer. So I, you know, I think the team's really working, those folks are really working hard. And I think it's important for the public to know they're not sitting wait, waiting around for snow. They're actually working really hard. Uh, doing all the things that Craig mentioned. so yeah. We don't want them going elsewhere because it might be hard to get them back in exactly. January. Exactly, right? and in the okay. meantime, they're doing lots of excellent work and we appreciate it. Okay, yeah. awesome. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the question. Can someone move that we go in camera, please? So moved. Thank Second. you. Second. Can I just get confirmation as to the sections that we're going into camera for? From, from you, advice from elected, or no, advice from, advice from officials. Advice from officials. So there'll be section. Section 24. Section 24. Okay, please vote. Mayor Sui, who is the seconder? Uh, I was Councillor uh, Rutherford, Councillor Rice, both did with uh, so Councillor Rice, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
We are back in public. Okay. We are back in public. Questions, Councilor Cardinal? Oh, you know. Uh, questions to administration? Okay. Oh, sorry. Councilor Principe? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do have a question in regards to um, some of the affordable housing or supportive housing units that we have already allocated funding towards, such as Clearview or Coliseum Inn. Uh, just wondering where the progress is where, with that uh, and if, if they're uh, full at capacity. I can tell you that uh, these are the projects that came through with Rapid Housing 1, 2, and 3. So for Rapid Housing 1, those are the units that were built at King Edward Park, MacArthur, West Mount, Inglewood, and Terrace Heights. All of those are completed. All of those are operational. All of those are, are fully utilized. I will pass it over to Stacey Galatly to talk about the project status updates for rounds two and three. Thank you. And maybe she's still coming online. So I can share that the Sands Hotel is in construction. Um, and they are going to be leveraging some of those spaces uh, for some... Uh, some, uh, some spaces for some trailers, uh, for some semi-private um, sheltering. Uh, the Days Inn, uh, that is completed, and those are 85 units. The Coliseum Inn has 98 units and it is in construction, and the opening date is looking like November of 2024, but in the interim, they will have uh, some spaces uh, to assist with uh, shelter this winter. And then with regard to um, Rapid Housing Initiative 3, Hollywood, uh, which is the permanent supportive housing of 63 units. Uh, they are in the foundations and piles situation and the target completion date is the end of November 2024. Okay, great. And I do have a question about the Petrolia. Uh, so are folks uh, currently living there still? No, they are not. They've uh, been moved to alternate locations. So the site is now secured um, and awaiting next steps. Okay, good. Uh, can you send that information to me that you, yeah, that would be great. Thank you very yeah, much. No problem. Great, thanks. And then I have a, another question about the police um, funding formula and salary settlement. I've been hearing numbers that uh, it was an increase of 1.6%, but my understanding is it was actually um, budgeted in the, budget that was passed last year, a portion of it. So the increase that we're seeing from 4.96 to 7.09 is actually 0.8%, is that correct? That's correct. So in the budget originally, we had 0.8%. That included, or yeah, 0.8%. That included a portion of the funding formula and a portion of the salary settlements. After the budget was passed, we council debated the funding formula and passed that and the arbitrated settlement came in that added an additional 0.8 for a total of 1.6 in the 7.09. Okay, great. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Rice? Uh, I don't, I lost track of rounds. Do we need a vote? Do we need to move another round or? I'll move another round. Yeah. Okay, Second. just a minute. Okay. No, no Councillor Rice has gone. Yeah. Okay, anyways, let's, let's vote for next round, please. Councillor Rice has. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Here we go. Okay, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Um, I want to ask, before process question, I, I want to ask another two questions. For the turf maintenance, for the turf maintenance, what is the current available funding and for the turf maintenance? And then I, I know we are not at the level, uh, service level we would like to do, but how much 
we are spending on that piece. I'll ask Craig McEwen to answer that one. Yeah, the, the current budget for uh, the turf and horticulture programs for 2024 uh, are 12.59 million and 6.58 million. So that would be uh, 12.6 million for turf and about six and a half million for horticulture. And that includes like weeding gardens, anything like uh, mulch beds, uh, that kind of work. That's the existing budget uh, for 2024. Uh, so if we, uh, if like Adam Antonius wants to say the service level improvements, so from your opinion, what's, how much additional funding needed for that piece? for the turf maintenance? Um, well, well, I would say, I, I would answer that by saying um, we're currently not achieving our service levels, levels that are posted online. So in the Parkland Care website, we have service levels that are publicly available uh, and we currently don't have the resources to meet those service levels. Uh, in order to meet the service levels across our various turf and horticulture programs, um, it would be another $2 million for turf and another 1.75 uh, for horticulture in order to meet uh, the existing service levels that we have posted today. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's very good. Uh, so the next question, I, I want to go to the pay as you go. And then if we considered all the proposed use the corporate pool funding and we still have like $12.4 million dollars, entirely as a pay as you go um, in the balance. Um, for, for the usage for this funding, what type of usage is eligible to use this funding? So you could use it for any capital project moving forward there, where there's a one-time expenditure or one-time cost. Uh, you just can't use it for anything that would be ongoing, but you can use it for any type of a capital project. Owning capital? Yes, that's what pays you go as far as for capital. And then, then my question back to the earlier, I still didn't get an answer. Why is it some funding listed on the operating could be used for capital? Is not the operation impact for that $26 million? So council, what you're seeing in the operating budget yeah. is you're seeing an increase in- Yeah, as a revenue. As a yeah, revenue, as a revenue and then on operating, but moved to the capital. Why moved in and we still have something left available, cannot move back to the operating? It's not ongoing funding. I can only put ongoing funding in the operating budget. Ongoing funding can put back to the operating Okay. If it was ongoing, but it's not. So it's one-time funding. So there, there is a component of pay-as-you-go every year that transfers into the capital budget. But what you have left here, $12.5 million, is all you have left for the cycle. If I put it back on the operating side, I could, and you reduce the tax levy, you would be violating the principle of one time of ongoing money for ongoing expenses. Um, I will I will follow up on that one, but I want, want to use the last few seconds to ask the process question. And for today, if we put on the amendment there, but is to is it close, or we cannot put any more and next Monday, or we still able to update and put more next Monday? Yeah. So that's sort of a great question for council to ask. So if everybody's ready to put their amendments on the floor. Um, so let's conclude the questions first, then we'll go to the process questions. Okay, okay. sure. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cardwell. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. My question. Pardon me. Is a follow-up to earlier today. Just wondering if we know how much is not allocated in that capital art thing. So I'm going to turn this over to either Harm or Adam. I can start. Harm can correct me. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> so the value that was was provided was was not accurate. It's not 17.3. It's 11.5 million. Of that 11.5 million, there is a degree of carry forward values that 
that are from previous art installations that were approved based on different projects. Also in that value is an amount for operations. So conservatively, uh, there's probably about $2 million available. Okay, thank you. That's fine, thank you. And harm? Okay, I got the thumbs up from harm. That, that, that's a minuscule amount, so it's fine. Yeah, well, that would be, I, am I correct in presuming that that would be one-time funding that would, and there's maybe $2 million available for the moment? It's an annual allocation, so it all depends on what the permanent decision is. You could make a decision within the four-year budget, but it's an annual allocation. Right, so, but all that's remaining in the four-year budget would be $2 million with, after Eligible. all the toing and froing. Yeah, and, and then even with that, there's a there's a potential impact to the operation components because you're removing a fairly large chunk of budget for the Edmonton Arts Council. Right, and that would be, and there would be nothing left for any other future potential art thing that we Correct. might want to do. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councilor Jans. Thank you. Um, I asked for this as a memo, and I appreciate it may not be uh, available or on hand now. I was just trying to get a sense of the property tax exemptions and how much that equates to. Like, how much, um, if the government of Alberta paid their share of property taxes, how much How much would that be? I'll see if uh, Mr. Zappo or Ms. Watt is online. Total, just so we can get that, I can get them online. Total, if my recollection is correct, total exemptions, so not just government, because a lot of a lot of organizations are exempt. Exempt, total exemptions are around 368 to 365 million. Sorry, what? <laughs> now I'm second guessing myself. Uh, okay, so that, I'm guessing that would be inclusive of all of the properties of the government of Alberta, which does that include the public Catholic Frankfurt school system? Okay, and that would also include the Chamber of Commerce? That would also include... Yeah, like profits. I am, that number is total exempt properties. Including churches? All of them. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I requested a memo about a disaggregation of that data in terms of categories. I'd be... I, I'm sure staff are working on it, but I'm curious about that. But my understanding is um, we have no, those properties are exempted by provincial legislation, that not by city policy, right? Like it's not like we voted to give the Chamber of Commerce a tax, like a tax exemption, right? Correct. There's a, there are, like council sometimes exempts properties, but for the most part exemptions are a uh, a product of legislation. For the most part, the exception being if we voted on it, say, like affordable housing. That's correct. Okay. Um, changing gears slightly, um, I also had been, and this this one is for, for uh, Mr. Robar's team. So I've been looking at trying to cost out how much parking's a major issue in my ward and folks are looking at parking passes. I see Calgary is effectively selling residential parking passes in some neighborhoods. Um, as I understand it, Calgary, like we are not looking at doing that approach, right? Like in our, because I know we have a curbside management strategy, but that's, that's not contemplated at this time, right? Are you asking if we're doing a residential parking program? I, I think that'd be the term. Yeah, like, are we selling? Because Calgary's selling permits. Are we selling permits? Yeah, I could pass it on to Craig. They're doing some work. On yeah, that. we have um, we have a residential parking program report that's scheduled for Q1 of next year. Um, so we're still pulling all the details together and finalizing what exactly those, what that program would look like. Um, it would be the first time the residential parking program um, will be updated. I want to say since the late 70s, uh, so it's it's been many decades since that program's been looked at. We are taking lessons learned from Calgary. Um, <clears throat> we did, and I've connected with my colleagues in Calgary as well in terms of the cost of certain uh, permits. Um, all of the details around the program, uh, we're pulling that together for a Q1 report, and we intend on 
uh, connecting with with uh, the councillors that are going to be impacted by any sort of program changes uh, before that report's published in the new year. So just to clarify, though, th I didn't miss that. That's that's not an assumption in this budget. Like we're not anticipating revenue in this budget from that. Uh, no, sorry. The any sort of like fees or anything like that towards the residential prog parking program um, are not embedded within the uh, uh, budget adjustment in front of us today. Okay. Um, and so I was trying to cost out what the estimate of, uh, okay, if we were to clear annually the snow and ice of a parking stall, if we were to clear sweep the spring sweep of a parking stall, um, that would be approximately $360 per year based on operations. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that was... Um, that estimate was was around uh, trying to map out square footage of a of a particular parking stall uh, and connecting that to the curbside management strategy, um, but uh, but there there are not fee increases or anything like that associated with the residential parking program or the curbside management strategy uh, within this within this budget adjustment. Right, and then if we were looking at the val to try and value uh, evaluation of that space, that could range from. You know, a few hundred to a few thousand, depending on the location of the parking stall. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay, thanks. Sorry, if I can just correct the number I gave for assessment, the 365 was for 2023. It's 425 in 2024, and we can take any of your questions in the next round. Okay. okay. All right. Councillor Rutherford. Sorry, can I just get confirmation on the numbers available for? reallocation for carbon credits? Kent's online uh, yeah. to follow up. Hello, Councillor. Kent Snyder. Um, so the renewable energy credits, um, we did provide that information earlier, and thank you for the opportunity to, to provide more accurate numbers. So starting in 2024, 3.3 million would be available to be reallocated. In 2025, it is 2.7 million. And then in 2026, it would be the full renewable energy credit budget of 5 million could be reallocated. Okay, thank you. That was my last question. Thank you. Any more questions? Seeing none, so at this time we have concluded questions on the capital budget, on the operating budget, Blatchford utility, waste utility, right? The things that were in front of us, we have concluded questions now. Uh, and the next step would be that uh, uh, the council will start by moving a motion to suspend some rules under our council procedures bylaw which will provide flexibility on making and debating amendments. I recommend Council suspend the rules to permit the mover of the main motion to also make amendments. Permit Council to debate the merits of the main motion and the amendments at the same time, and to remove the requirement to vote on a second round of questions. Uh, we will now put the proposed motion on the screen to suspend these three rules. So moved. Thank you, Councillor. Second. Second was Councillor Stevenson. So we will have that on the screen. Can you read that into the record, Councillor uh, Jens, please? I move that the following sections of Council Procedures Bylaw 18155 be waived for the discussion of items 5152, 5354, and 55. To be one, uh, a councillor may not amend their own motion. To be five, during debate on an amendment to a motion, councillors may only debate the amendment. Uh, through three B four, during a council meeting, councillors may only ask questions once in relation to a single item for up to five minutes unless council by motion permits councillors to ask questions for up to an additional five minutes. 
All right, so we have a motion on the floor related to suspending of rules. Now we can ask questions on this, right? So this would be the time to ask process questions, uh, to No, so th what's on the floor right now is just to suspend your rules. Okay, after that we can let's ask questions. Let's not do process. Okay, yeah. so let's, uh, any questions on suspending the rules? Councillor Rutherford. I guess just what the rationale is around, I get the suspension of the, the motion, like I get through 28-1, um, but why wouldn't we want to focus on amendments? Like what's the rationale for two and three? It has been our experience that when councillors are debating um, amendments for reduction or increases, you can't help, not can't help. It is often the practice to consider the impact of the overall budget that you're passing. And that's why sometimes the debate can wander between tax levy increase okay. versus overall okay. budget impact. So if we limit it to just the amendment on the floor, that makes it really that's tight. very restrictive, and I don't okay, think that's helpful. That helps. And what about for thirty-eight four? That's just for expediency. Is it expedient though? That's a <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> Might not touch that. Don't one. have to keep track of. Uh, the rounds, right? So well, <laughs> so it's only two, though, right? After two, we'd still have to get permission. No, as no. many rounds. As many rounds and rounds. If you don't want to, like, ha happy to strike out thirty-eight point four, but then we just spend time putting motions into the system to have more rounds of questions. I, okay, I'll think about it. I, I don't know if I can support the third, the okay. third point. Okay. Councillor Wright. We still are restricted to five minutes at a time though, Yes, right? we are. <laughs> okay. For the first round, yes. But overall, I, you're, there is no restriction if this passes. You can keep asking questions. But each round, we're each restricted round. to five. Yep. Yes, okay, yep. For thank sure. you. Yep. Yeah, it's not like, we're not going to filibuster no, all no. night long? Okay, good. No, Thank you. nobody wants to do that. We've never done that anyways, right? So we're not a parliament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Councillor Tang. Um, so just to be clear on that, um, so the reason, the other reason why I wouldn't, because I'm trying to imagine how it will work if we kept that piece, because we will already have a motion, the main motion, the main budget motion on the floor already. That's right. So you can't have another... Motion to for a second. We third. do. So oh, for, okay. for budget processes, because it lasts over multiple days. Oh, okay. Um, so it well, doesn't conflict. I guess. It doesn't conflict. The, the main budget motion's on the floor, but when you have to deal with procedural motions to go in private, exchange orders. Oh, true. Day, yeah, yeah, yeah. We okay. sort of just set them aside. This has been common practice since okay. I've been here. If you don't want to do this, it is super easy to strike it. Friendly reminder, special resolution is required to change and suspend your rules. So these okay. are your processes. We're happy to accommodate. No, I'm, I'm good. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Just to speak. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just ask a question. It's, uh, you know, my thoughts, but as a don't you think no worries, question. No worries. Don't, don't you, no don't you thinks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, following the rules. Okay. All right. So we have concluded all the questions on the suspension of the rules. Uh, anyone to speak? Councillor Paquette, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just want to say I, I support this motion. Um, uh, it, this is, we've, we've done this in the past. It works out really, really well. It helps provide a focus to the questions. And generally, um, because you may have a, a sort of limit, the questions tend to be really uh, direct and, and uh, helpful. And there's nothing stopping if there's like a really good line of questioning happening from council like voting to uh, give a, any councillor an additional five minutes. So um, I'm really comfortable with it. It's worked really well in the past and I, I think that it'll work well in this process as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Gone now to the mover of the motion you want to close. No? Okay, let's vote then, please. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jones.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Now that we have concluded all of the questions, uh, maybe at this time process questions can be asked? Okay. Any pro process questions? No. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. You had a process question. I already asked. I'm just waiting for city clerk's response. So once the process starts, would it be helpful if I walk through what I understand is going to happen? Because it's not up to me to tell you that you can't make amendments anymore. It's up to sort of council. So if you're, is your intention to start uh, making all of your amendments related to capital and operating today, put them all on the floor? Yeah, I, 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 I am not ready, right, for the, uh, I have to have some conversation with the staff around Omnibus, right, so, uh, uh, but I, if, if, uh, if council members are ready, we can have them on the, on the, on the floor, but I don't think we'll be debating amendments today. So the process was that you got to go first. That was what council decided. To to even to move or to debate. We're not. It was my understanding that you weren't doing any debating until yeah. everybody was ready, and yeah. so they would all be put on the floor. So how it happened last year, which was the direction we received a few weeks ago, is that we start with yourself. And that you I get to move that I I get that I make do like so that I make I move the. Omnibus first before anyone else moves others? Yes, that okay. way the councillors are aware of what your intentions okay. are as you're not part of the randomization process and okay. then that helps inform whether or not they want to make amendments. If we start with councillors first, they don't know, as neither do I, what you're going to make and then we're going to find ourselves in an interesting situation where we could have multiple councillors making the same amendments. Oh, I see. Okay, and what you're saying. going to come in and may also make the same thing and then I'm not sure where to yeah. start. I think we just wordsmithing my omnibus with the, uh, in, make sure it's compliant with the, whatever, but everybody knows, I think intent has been shared, right? So uh, uh, there might be some minor changes, but I think other council members know what is in the. Do you want to take an early recess? We could take, uh, I. Then come back at yeah, but let's, so let's maybe, Okay, that is clear. So that means that I I, I would have to uh, make the omnibus first, and other councils can make it before that. Right? So that that part is clear. Let's clarify other process questions, Councillor Councillor Nack. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Uh, just one process question, because there were no questions uh, of anyone from admin on the utility budget, I believe. So sorry, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I, yeah, no, that's fine. I, I just wanted to ask it, you, you the question. Since there were no questions of administration on the utility budget, can we just clear, like, it feels like we can just clear that one, like, because I don't know if there's staff still sitting around waiting to be asked questions, and if there are, like, let's let them go, if, because nobody's if asked you could, questions. If you felt like before you recessed approving both utility budgets and the bylaw, that would be a great start. Yeah, okay. and we can finish the rest of the question. I just wanted to flag yeah. that, because I'd like to get that done and out of the yep. way. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Tang? So, sorry. No, oh, sorry, yes, 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 on yes, the first sorry. round on this, yeah, yeah. on this round. Um, so yes, to build on that, because I thought I had heard in the opening, your, your opening to this entire budget process is that after the, AB, you know, after we do the, um, the Q and A, but we want to vote on five, three, five, four, and then the bylaw and then go back to capital and operating. Is yeah. that my understanding? That was what I had put in the mayor's yeah. speech because I wasn't sure if there was going to be any questions right. of utility and I thought if that could be dealt with right off the bat, that would just free up some time, but you and, can do it And now. then we can table the, the main capital and operating budget. So just friendly reminder, we have budgets. These are all just at minor adjustments. And so if you clear the decks for the two utilities and vote on the bylaw, then what you're left with is the carbon budget, go back to capital, put the capital budget adjustment motion on the floor, and then work through any potential amendments. You could, and what was recommended, this was a discussion last year and again this year, then you would actually vote and complete the capital before you move on to operating. Right. So 
I don't know if council has a lot of capital amendments, but if not, that's also possibly something that could be resolved today, and then we would just be left with operating. With operating, so five two as the last thing we yeah. Yep, we okay. could do that. Yep. So the order is five three five four seven one five 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 one five two. Could could be yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So once we have cleared the process questions, we can deal with the uh, yep. uh, the Blatchford utility and the waste utility and the bylaw. Okay. Councillor uh, Cartmill, go ahead. Thank you. My question is around reconsideration motions. So if an amendment is made and passed and then uh, someone wants to move a reconsideration motion, do, does the rule around being on the prevailing side still apply? The first a, question is, is, is the reconsideration within the same meeting that it was originally passed in? Yeah, yeah, as part of this meeting, as part of this ongoing meeting. So, you know, an amendment is, amendment is put forth, voted on, passed, but then someone wants to reconsider that amendment. Is a reconsideration motion then moved and is it restricted to just somebody on the prevailing side? Yes, I'm just trying to think why council would pass an amendment and then unpass an amendment in the same meeting. Well, I can, I, if I yep, could offer yep, our- Yep, sure. Uh, we pass a bunch of amendments. The tax levy goes up to a 15.8% property tax yep. increase and someone says, geez, that's too high. I'd like to reconsider a couple of those ideas. Can, is that reconsideration motion yes. possible? Yep. And is it only somebody that was on the prevailing side of that particular amendment that can move a reconsideration motion? Yes. Okay. And if the mayor's omnibus is, is that read as a collection of individual amendments or is that one amendment? So last year it was treated as individual amendments. Okay. Now the question, I, once it gets put on the floor and once we have it, will it be split for voting purposes or will it be voted on at once? If it's voted on as once, it is one amendment with multiple parts. So that's important that we see it and that's a question for council to, to tell us okay. how you're gonna be treating that. But if, it's, but if it is split piece by piece, I think that's what happened last time. That is. Then each of those pieces could then be offered up for reconsideration by someone on the prevailing side. Yes, the only caveat I would have is hypothetically if there are reductions that are then used as increases, that's where this gets tricky. So we're talking, of course, hypotheticals, but if the mayor's omnibus motion includes both parts and it's split, that will change. Like once we, once we see it and once you see it and council decides how you want to vote on it, then I can probably give better advice. So it, it would be cleaner from that perspective if it was voted on a discrete set of increases and decreases. I agree. If, if just you, offered at once. If the omnibus could be split into two parts, that might be easier. Well, split into several parts. Hypothetically, if there were more than one amendment in each basket, yes. Right, yeah. Yep. Right. For sure. Once we see it, it'll be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, Councilor Salvador? Yeah, so right now we are... Process questions. Yeah, no, process question. Um, just going back to the earlier point around uh, putting amendments. Like for me, for example, it's, it's going to depend on what is included in the multi-part. And that's why sequencing does, does matter, for okay. me at least. Yeah, got it. So I'm just being try, trying to get clarity. So we are following multi-part first, and then if there are additions, they would come after? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so are we going to be recessing right now and then coming back with that multi-part, or? After, and of course, do the, like, what is it, five, five, three, five, four? And seven, one. one. And five, five. <laughs> so we're going to be doing the other items, and then is the intention yeah. to come back and start putting multi-part, et cetera, et cetera, on the floor today? Yeah. Yes. Okay. If possible. Depending on timing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, that makes sense to me. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, Councillor uh, Wright. Hi, so um, all the amendments will go on the floor, including the potential omnibus, and, and we, will, we will be advised or, or 
um, provided information as to what that impact would be on the total tax levy, correct? With Because I, I think we did that last time with the budget, with the amendments. Okay. So if... So I think if people are thinking uh, and looking at other amendments, um, I, I don't see why we need to break apart and vote separately on the on the omnibus because we will already know what the impact's going to be. So, well, and if you don't agree, because that's I guess going to impact other amendments that you might be putting on, then I guess you would vote against it to allow more options for your own I, I, I for simplicity I, I'm I'm thinking one omnibus but I guess we'll we'll vote on that when the time comes and then any amendments that want to be done in so just after. a friendly reminder council agreed in the process um, in the attachment and we're happy to share the attachment that you're going to do capital first so if you don't finish and vote on capital today we're not going to get to operating because it was intentional, or council made an intentional decision to separate everything, and so they're done discreetly. So if you can deal with utilities today and deal with capital today, then we'll get to operating, and then yeah. we can probably get into those questions. Yeah. And, and the omnibus would have to be one for capital, one for operation. Like uh, if yes, everything, yeah. they're yeah. totally separate. Yeah, yeah. they're very yeah. separate, yeah. Yeah, got it. Okay, any other process, right? Related questions, seeing none. Okay, then we can get on to which one should we? There'll be the. You can deal with if you want to deal with sub or sorry, seven, seven, four, five, four, and five, three together. You so can sorry, do. Uh, say it again. Five, if, three. If you want to deal with five, three, and five, four together. Yeah. And then. Assuming that passes, which I shouldn't assume, then you can just deal with the bylaw. Motion to bring forward 5-3 and 5-4. You don't even need to bring them forward because this whole thing has been cross-referenced, so I oh, think you're okay. Okay, so can someone move? Mayor yes. Sohi. Yes, go ahead. It would be my pleasure <laughs> to move the recommendations in items 5.3 and 5.4. And I can Second. read them in if you like. Yeah, yeah. Second by Councillor Tang. Okay, please do. I read the recommendations in. So on item 5.3, I will move that the Blatchford Renewable Energy Utility 2024 rate filing as outlined in attachment 1 of the November 3rd, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS 02051 be approved and A, that the 2024 to 2026 Blatchford Renewable Energy Utility Operating Budget as originally approved in the November 25th, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS 01479 be adjusted as follows. One, 2024 operating budget within operating revenues, with operating revenues be reduced by $1,160,000. Two, 2024, Five, operating budget with operating revenues be reduced by $2,030,000. And item three, the 2026 operating budget with operating revenues be reduced by $2,100,000. Thank you. And then I can on... Uh, and the next one? Yeah. On four. Yeah. Also move that one... $18,513,872 of replacement costs in the item 3-1 communal collection program capital profile 23-81-2054 as detailed in attachment 1 of the November 3rd 2023 city operations report C0 pardon me CO02061 be removed and 2 that the four funding source adjustments in the Source Separated Organics Program 20-81-2041, Organic Screening and Mixing System 23-81-3060, High Solids Anaerobic Digestion Facility Item 13-33-2023, and Refuse Derived Fuel Facility Enhancements uh, Envelope 20-81-2052 Capital Profiles 
as detailed in attachment one of the city operations report CO02061 items 51, 52, 53, and 54 be approved. All right, that was second by Councillor Tang already, both of them, you did? Yeah, and now we have motions on the floor. And now to speak to the motions. No conclude, close. Nothing further. Good, okay, please vote. We're just getting the vote loaded, just bear with us. I would offer that waste is underrated. Take that, Councillor Paquette. What? <laughs> We're still streaming, so. The vote is live. Just waiting on two votes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried now on to the bylaw, Councillor Cardinal. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move that bylaw 20628 to amend bylaw 17943, Blatchford Renewable Energy Utility Amendment Number 5. For first reading. Second. Oh, a second, Councillor Paquette, right? Okay. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of bylaw 20628. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. 
Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of bylaw 20628. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20628. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. So we dealt with five three, five four. Seven one. Okay, five point five. Five point five. Okay, that's done. I can move that, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just give me one second. Okay. Constance Salvador? Uh, I'll yeah. move that the November 7, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 02055, be received for information. Second. Okay. All right. So we have motion on the floor. Anyone wish to speak? Constance Salvador to close, to vote. To vote, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Just waiting on two votes. I'm a yes. Thank you, uh, It's Hamilton. not coming up here. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I couldn't write yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we are at 327. We will take a break now. When we come back, uh, we will start with 5.1, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody anybody desired to take a longer break, or I know I I'm I'm good to go on the uh, on the capital. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can only do in capital first, right? So we'll do capital then. All right, so we will be back at uh, 3.45.
We're live from council chamber. All right, Chris. Okay, we are back and would like to call this meeting back to order. Do a roll call. <coughs> Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Neck. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Hello. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Uh, Councillor <coughs> Rutherford. Hello. 
Council Salvador. Hello. Council Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Reis. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay, so we are we suspended the rules. We voted on this suspension of rules. We have spoken on the suspension of the rules. Uh, now we I would ask that we start with item 5.1, right? Uh, the capital budget adjustment. If we could start with someone putting the recommended motion on the floor related to adjustments only, then we can move to amendments. All amendments will be moved, seconded with unanimous consent postponed. Okay. All right, can someone move to have the recommended motion on the floor. Councilor Knack? Sure, yeah. No, no. Right, just anyone. Uh, okay, I will move, number one, that the adjustments to the 2023 through 2026 capital budget as outlined in attachment six of the November 7th, 2023 financial and corporate services report be approved. Number two, that the Adjustment to the 2023 through 2026 capital budget as outlined in attachment 10 of the November 7th, 2023 financial and corporate services report be approved. And then three. Yeah, just the third part, exactly. That the exception for the capital profile CM 200330, active transportation implementation acceleration approach three, as outlined in attachment. Wait a second. Yeah, as, yeah uh, as there it is. Uh, Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS 02053 be approved. Second. That's second by Councillor uh, Tang, right? Okay. All right. So uh, now we move to uh, amendment side. Okay. Huh? And I will give the ask Councillor uh, Principe to take the chair, please. Sure, I'll take the chair. Okay. I will move that an exemption to Council Policy C two one seven E. Reserve and equity accounts be approved on a one-time basis for the pur purpose of using the LRT reserve to fund up to $14.78 million in one-time funding for purchase of diesel buses and that the new capital profile 24613623 growth buses for $15.78 million in 2025 to purchase 20 diesel buses in support of Edmonton Transit Service service growth be approved with $1 million in funding from Pay As You Go and $14.78 million in funding from the LRT Reserve. Second. Second. <laughs> I was afraid for a minute. <laughs> Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, uh, I'll pick Councillor Stevenson a second, sorry. <laughs> Ruth by Mayor Sully, seconded by Councillor Stevenson. And like we don't make introductions or anything, we just tabling them now, right? Yeah. yeah, and then once, just before it's put, then you'll vote, then you can have your two minutes. Okay. And then debate. I'll return the chair then. Okay. Right, okay. Now, further amendments on the capital budget. Oh, Tim. Oh, sorry. Can I miss I'm asking for amendments on capital. 
Okay. Okay, Councillor Rice. Uh, I do have just only one. Um, I don't know this wording is a uh, meets the requirements uh, from City Kirk. Is reduce the. Uh, uh, I try to read it here from my phone. Uh, reduce. One reduce from. Uh, reduce uh, twenty six point eight oh eight million dollars from the two thousand twenty four capital budget, <clears throat> and keep this amount in the original funding pool. Eight oh eight as listed on two thousand twenty four um, operating budget. Can you state that again, Councillor? Um, I, I move that, uh, not move, just the table. Reduced the uh, 26,808 million dollars and from the 2024 capital budget and keep this same amount in the original funding pool as listed on 2024 operating budget in attachment one. Okay, I need a seconder. Second. Councillor Principe. So, uh, Mayor Sohi, yeah. I do apologize. I don't know what that means, I'm very sorry. So mm -hmm. before we get to a seconder, can I just, I'm in the document, Councillor Rice, I still just, I don't know, what is it you're reducing? Where's the uh, 26 million coming from? On it, this redu redu reduce 26.808 million dollars. That is a part of 2023 Q3 investment earning update on page five on capital budget. So I want to reduce the 26.808 million dollars and from total 61.4. Isn't attachment one summary capital uh, no, budget? No, it's a capital Which report. attachment? Which attachment on the? Capital oh. reports page five. Okay. Yeah, main reports page five. Okay. Yeah. I think Stacy can help us out here. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so if you're, what I think I'm hearing you say is you'd yeah. like to remove that money from the corporate pool. Uh, from capital, yes. So to do that, you actually have to amend the operating budget because it gets into the operating budget. It gets into the capital budget by virtue of the operating budget. But for operating budget, it's it's still keep on that list as a revenue. And there is no change for the operating budget. But if you're wanting to take the the funding out of the corporate pool, yeah. The expense in the operating side provides the funding on the capital side. So it's actually an operating budget amendment. Then I need you to tell me which of those projects, like we will just unfund every project in there then, okay. in that so, table. So we will consider make this amendment when we come to operating, because this is not a capital amendment. So. Well, I, that's how you get the funding out of there. Yeah. But if you wanted, if you take out the funding, we're using it to fund things. Yeah. So if, to be crystal clear, then what I would, if that funding doesn't exist, I need a reduction. I need an equivalent reduction of $26.8 million in capital projects yeah. that you're not going to So the amendment approve. that Councillor Rice wants to put if she puts that amendment at the during the operational operating budget discussion, if that passes, then you would we have to make a decision on how to reduce the capital budget. So actually, I'm going to say it this way. Yeah. If you want to do that, the first thing you have to do is unfund all the capital. Yeah. Oh, I see. Unfund okay. the capital, and then if you are successful in unfunding the capital, you can put it back on the operating side. Okay. And do you, Councillor Rice, do you have the list of all the projects that would be un required to be unfunded in order for that to be? Uh, yes, on the page, on page six, 
I have the list. Then you have to move that, those. You have to move, am I right? The, uh, Councillor Rice would have to make amendment to cancel those capital projects as part of her amendment. That then yes. it would be yep. amendment in order. Yeah, so Councillor Rice, you're saying page six of which attachment, sorry? Just uh, so I would like to, because it's proposed to use, I would like to uh, reduce $26.8 million on these two projects. And one is about affordable housing land, land acquisition and site development. That is $22.9 million. So another one and is $2 million, $2 million reduction and from the Petronia housing complex demolish. Demolition, yeah. And then another one, another $2 million and from in private discussion from eight million dollars to six million dollars reduced two million dollars oh, okay. so, so is that added together is 26 26 no so 22.9 million from housing yeah two million from uh, in uh, private discussion yeah. and the two million from like demolish two million from petroleum housing uh, petroleum housing demolition okay so for 26.9, right? So the issue that I would just observe is petroleum demolition, we need 5.9 to demolish. If you reduce it by two, I might not be able to demolish it. Okay. So in that case, I can move that two million and to the reserved 12.4, and then that means reduce the 12.4 million dollars to 10.4 million dollars. No. The 12.4 is a product of what you're reducing. You have to reduce one, you have to reduce $26.8 million of those five lines above it, the 12.4. Oh, 26. Consider it's your way over time, I'm sorry. I am yeah. sorry, but but this is something I want to do. It. No, I and, understand. I understand. And then if I could get help and offline, I, I don't want yeah. to stay long time for everybody's time. Yeah, but we have to. Okay. Point point of and order. Yes. We had prep time. We've had time and offers to work with administration up until this point. Yes. I I I just want to make sure that we stay on track and respect everybody's time up here. Yeah. I understand. I'm just trying to be as accommodating as possible. So I understand. Thank you so much for that. So is, uh, are, there, are there any other capital amendments? Councillor Principe? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, my wording is not very good and I apologize. Uh, that composite profile CM-20-0330 active transportation uh, be decreased by $50 million with remaining 50 million, oh, with that 50 million going towards the tax levy. So the or, 50 million can I know go towards, it doesn't go towards the tax levy. You want goal. us to release the debt servicing yes. associated yeah. with the $50 million reduction Correct. from the tax levy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Need a seconder? Second. Okay. Councillor Principe, for clarity, can you just repeat the motion? Chris will put it in the chat for you. Okay, any other capital amendments? I don't see any other capital amendments. And consular race is uh, possible, like I, 
I know I, I think crafting an amendment on the fly is problematic, right? It's difficult to, to do. But I still want to be fair in this board that you're given the time. I, it's like we don't, there's not many amendments on the floor, so. But we we can't. The problem is that we want we have to table all the amendments first before we start debating them to according to the process. How much time would it take, Councillor Rice, to for you to figure it out, the amendment? Um. So my apologies for the time and I'm taking, but I I'm really confused here. Infosys is a proposal. And why I cannot make amendment say, oh, you, we must get this demolish amount. And then if it's proposal, that means to me, could interpret and I can make amendment. So what we will do, we'll, we'll take 10 minute break and please work with clerk's office to find the right wording for your amendment. And if that wording is not figured out in 10 minutes, then unfortunately I would have to rule out that we need to carry on with the, the rest of the procedures. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute recess.
Can we call to order, please? Mr. Chair? No, it's been 10 minutes. I would like to call to order. It is 20 after 4. Okay. Well, you have to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We are live. All right, we are live. We are live now. We are back. We'll do a quick roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Nack. Good afternoon. Councillor Pinsby. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hi. Councillor Cardinal. Hello. Councillor Rice. Here. And Councillor Jens. Yep. All right. So I'll go back to Councillor Rice to move her amendment. Okay, uh, thank you everyone and appreciate your patience on this. Uh, based on discussion with um, state administration, so I move that um, specifically reduce, is not actually reduce, is just the move the proposed use of corporate pool funding and then for affordable housing land acquisition and the sign site development by $22.9 million. And also um, remove or reduce that in private discussion by $2 million. And, and reduce the demolition by $2 million. So that adds up. Is Twenty-six point nine million. Councillor Wright, we can't do a partial for the demolition. With the demolition, we either it needs to be fully funded or not funded. We can't so do a partial. That, we if can't that do is a partial. case, if that's his case, and then reduced by twenty-four point nine million dollars. So just for clarity, you can't reduce three things at one time because councillors aren't permitted to make multi-part motions. So those will be three separate budget reduction amendments and a fully fully capital. So they'll be so Councillor Rice is not yep. gonna not gonna move forward on demolition. So there'll be two motions, one for affordable housing, twenty two point nine million dollars, and one for two million dollars in private discussion. Right? So then the motion should be reduce the investment earning update from sixty $61.4 million reduced by... No, you no. have to, you're going to unfund a profile. So three motions. Unfund, what, I, what I heard you say yep. just now is unfund affordable housing, land acquisition, and site development. If you unfund that, the money returns to the corporate pool. Amend the $8 million to $6 million, if you do that, $2 million returns to the pool. Amend Petrolia Housing five point, from 5.9 to 3.9, 2 million returns to the pool, but I will tell you that you cannot demolish Petrolia Housing then. And just for clarity, those are three individual amendments. And we'll have to craft the actual okay. wording before you vote on that. Okay, so those three amendments have been made by Councillor Rice and second by? Second. Okay, and those are three separate individual amendments. Okay, so now we have five amendments Correct. on the floor. Okay, any other amendments? Okay, can we start the discussion on amendments now, right? Well, so if we have five, and so we're scrambling because we didn't have those last ones drafted. So now what I would suggest you do before you debate, you debate them was we should figure out uh, what we're going to debate. And so we can start with your motion on the floor, yeah. bring yours back. But technically we should be doing the randomization so oh, yeah. that both Councillor Principe and Councillor Rice understand the order that they're going to be going in. Oh, they are recognizing or maybe we don't have to do that, but it's a process. Let's follow the it process. It makes no difference. If you don't have to it would save us having to do something and we could focus on crafting the amendments. Yeah. If you want to just go back and forth. Yeah, so I'll do mine, yep. then go to Councillor 
confidence pay, then consularize, sure. consularize, consularize. Is that okay? Thank consularize? you. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, then I can uh, cede the chair to uh, 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 chair to uh, Councillor Principe. I'll take the chair. Okay. All right. So the mayor will get two minutes to introduce his his amendment, and then we're back to regular rules of debate. Thank you. Would you like to introduce? Uh, I will. The uh, this is tied into these are I mean the capital uh, profile will have an operational impact, which we will talk later on. Right. This is the idea is to. Uh, purchase 20 buses that will allow us to add significant amount of bus service that has been lacking. And we heard from administration the last time we added significant amount of bus service other than what we did during the last budget, which was making, making uh, on-demand permanent. This will allow us the opportunity to uh, uh, add more service by buying these buses and the uh, and the purchase of the uh, or leasing of the uh, satellite uh, site, which will be part of the uh, operational discussion. The idea is that ser uh, transit service, bus service, has been lacking, and we need to catch up, and we need to make sure that people have access to um, good, reliable public transit service uh, throughout the uh, the city. And this, was, this will also allow us to repurpose some of the on-demand uh, service because uh, if uh, approved, then we will be able to uh, put permanent service in areas where service standards have, uh, the, or, or the ridership has exceeded service standards that we can move that from on-demand to a conventional uh, uh, transit. So that's the idea behind it. Thank you for that introduction. Does that, anyone have any questions on the motion that's on the floor? Doesn't look like there are any questions. Anyone to speak to this motion? Councillor Hamilton, please go ahead. I, I actually had questions, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Please go ahead with questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, to the mover, um, you know, I understand that there is some concern with the electric bus, um, uh, electric bus procurement, but I'm wondering why specifically diesel buses uh, are, are specified in your motion. Uh, as opposed to being agnostic to the fuel uh, or energy type. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that because we are buying, giving direction to buy 20 buses, and there's a, uh, uh, there's a certainty around cost about diesel buses, so the cost is cost of uh, 15 million uh, is based on that 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 analysis but uh, if administration has anything else to add to that uh, they can but it's just to, uh, uh, the, this cost cost uncertainty whether hydrogen buses or electric buses will be more expensive or not um, maybe yeah maybe if mr rovar is present and i'd be interested in hearing uh, it's less about the costs I guess, yeah, maybe we'll start there. I appreciate the cost certainty piece. Um, is, uh, for instance, our hydrogen buses so much more volatile in their pricing? I think with hydrogen buses, you're looking at uh, probably twice the cost, if not a little bit more than that. Um, so where a diesel bus might go for about 750000 a hydrogen bus is probably about $1.65 million per vehicle, so it would be a significant cost difference. The thing with the uh, this satellite garage, 
uh, and that's what we're talking about here is, is adding buses to a satellite facility. That facility is not uh, upfitted for hydrogen vehicles as well or, uh, or battery electric, so that would be a significant change to that facility if we were to put those vehicles in that facility. Um, and I'll just turn it over to Carrie if I've missed anything. I'll just say the satellite facility was intended always to take the diesel. So the adjustments, if we do hydrogen, would go into Centennial Garage. Um, so this uh, diesel plan uh, is lower cost. The modern diesels also have lower emissions than the older ones as well. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Rice, please go ahead. Um, so last year when we developed 2023-26 budget, uh, what existing budget and for purchase buses, I remember we have that, we had that budget approved last year. Are you asking how many buses we purchased last yeah, la year? Yeah, last budget? year the budget approved the budget amount. I think Carrie could probably give that information. To I think it was purchase new buses. So the budget decision last year was about renewal. 24% uh, of our normal renewal was funded. I don't have the exact figure, but we can get that for you. Uh, there was zero dollars for any growth buses. Um, so... For this motion um, on the floor, um, the funding source from um, pay as you go, and the, that means is from that twelve point four million dollars, right? That's correct. And how much ART reserve available right now? So currently, Councillor, there is. $29.3 million in the LRT reserve. And after this, there'll, after this, there'll be $9.5 million remaining if this passes. So only $9.5 reser reserve and it will Sorry, be I'm going to make a correction. There's, there's $24,186 remaining. So but after this. Available. Yeah. So, no, this is before. So Before. Yeah. Um, okay. So... Do we have any um, policy or any other type of sense in place to ensure we have to have minimal ART reserve to ensure our ART project right now is going on to have the money in for some emergency needed? Do we, if an are you are you asking if yeah. we have enough money in the LRT reserve, reserve the res yeah. if an emergency is required? Yeah. So the LRT reserve is primarily there to fund LRT operations. So any you, the FSR is what helps you in an emergency. Maybe I'll just put it that way. But in specific from the LRT, we have LRT West West Nine, and we have. ART South 9. So, Councillor Rice, I also want to clarify that that doesn't necessarily, the $24 million doesn't, isn't necessarily the full LRT reserve. It was the, the amount that, that was a, released as part of the OP-12. Originally, administration had indicated that they would be comfortable allowing $34 million to be used of the LRT reserve. Of that, $4.7 million was allocated to uh, project and capital. And then there was $5.1 million that was used uh, for snow and ice that the mayor made a couple weeks ago. And what that leaves $24 million. So what's on the table is what administration felt they were comfortable offering up for distribution from council. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Any other questions? Anyone to speak to the motion? Mayor Soe, would you like to close? No, I, uh, I want to really uh, ur urge my colleagues to, uh, uh, to support this. I would have more 
to speak on when we go to the operations uh, around uh, why we need to uh, improve bus service and how, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that at that time, uh, but this is if we want to improve bus service, there's operational component related to this, but this is a critical part, right? But our process is that we have to talk about capital then operations later on, right? So I would encourage people to uh, to support this, uh, this corresponding uh, operational cost to this, and uh, uh, that needs to be approved as well. If that doesn't approve, this becomes irrelevant at that time, right? So I think we'll have, I have more to say that time on, on the overall improvement of bus service, but I would encourage council members to support this. Thank you. I will ask uh, my colleagues to vote, please. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. I'll pass the chair back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Principe. And I'll go to you uh, to, uh, uh, to make an introduction to your uh, amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, state the motion. It is that capital profile CM-20-030 active transportation implementation acceleration approach three be reduced by $50 million, $16,350,000 in 2024, $16,825,000 in 2025, and $16,825,000 in 2026 with funding to tax-supported debt or from tax-supported debt? You are just going to unfund it and then unfund the debt, right? Yeah, you're reducing the tax-supported debt. Okay. So it could say so with, fun with the funding decrease to tax-supported debt or something like with that. With funding decrease to yeah. tax-supported debt. Okay. That'll be friendly change the wording. Make an introduction, please. Yes, so uh, the reason I'm doing this, I uh, brought forward this motion. Uh, during discussion and questions, I had asked what was the uh, other amount of money that we were spending on um, active transportation. And uh, we c I couldn't get a, a, a full answer just because it's, it's uh, very varied and uh, hard to put an exact amount towards because uh, because of the nature of it. It's through neighborhood renewal and such. So I had to come up with an amount that I thought would be inclusive of the many other uh, profiles that are being completed uh, of uh, active transportation. So I thought that this was a fair, a fair amount that uh, would still see some implementation, but yet not uh, as much as, as uh, we currently had uh, approved in the budget last year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Principe. Any questions, colleagues? Councillor Tang? Great, thank you very much. Um, so if I understand your intent, this is to help offset 2024 tax levy. No. Okay, and um, so can you just reiterate what your intent for this is? My intent is to um, try to minimize the tax-supported debt because that's our third largest uh, expense. Okay, because I think in your original statement, I thought I heard um, release it to the levy. Anyways, uh, thank you for that. Um, to administration, what is our current debt servicing from um, or I guess, what is the debt servicing from 50 million? So Councillor Ta uh, Councillor Tang, if you reduced 50 million from the bike lanes, I think just high level numbers, you'd probably be saving $123,000 in debt servicing in 2024, uh, 776,000 in 2025, and approximately 1.9 million in 2026. 
Okay, sorry. So 2024 is 123,000. Right. 2025 is 700. 776,000. 1,000, okay. Yeah. Um, and so in 2024, what, what difference would that make for um, the reduction on, on the tax levy? I'm curious. So as a percentage, yeah. it, would be, it would be tiny. Um, maybe just the one thing I'd add to Mr. Rye's comments is to borrow $100 million was 7.8. To borrow $50 million is half of that, so roughly 3.9. Three point nine on an ongoing basis, right? So, like, ultimately, when you build out, it will save you three point nine annually. But the amounts, because yeah. because you weren't seeing them come in over this cycle, you were seeing them come in start in 2024, 25, 26, mm -hmm. but you weren't seeing the full seven point eight until 2029. That's when you'd see the full fifty percent reduction. Like, okay, I'm not doing a good job explaining. This no. <laughs> It's okay. Maybe I'll just switch my question. What is the total debt servicing cost for the entire capital budget? While you're looking at that number, um, I guess to Mr. Lachlan, what would be the impact for, I guess, you know, our, our, our infrastructure capital plan on this. We, we're just finished formalizing. Um, uh, 2023 was a planning year. So 2024, 25, and 26 were implementation years. We'd basically be cutting it in half. Um, the approaches that we had were um, expanding shared use paths and adaptable infrastructure. So essentially, we'd be cutting the program in half and, and deprioritizing um, what we've identified. And I imagine you had to probably go back to the drawing board in terms of redoing the entire year of design work. Um, maybe not an entire year, but yeah, we'd probably have to go back and reprioritize, which would consume part of 2024. Right. Council Tang, debt servicing for 2024. Like the net debt servicing with the tax levy impact is around three hundred and eighty six million dollars. Three hundred and eighty six million. And that's just that's just the tax supported debt servicing. Right. And so for this portion we're talking about one hundred and twenty three thousand out of three hundred and eighty six million. The tax levy impact for that is a point zero one percent for twenty twenty four, point zero four percent for twenty twenty five, and point zero nine percent for twenty twenty six. Thank you. Oh, I'm done. No, I'm Thank not. So I have one minute left. <laughs> Um, last question uh, to Ms. Petrin. Uh, this was a fairly significant, si um, you know, uh, takes up significant, I don't know what the word is, uh, footprint with our carbon budget. Um, that was part of a big discussion around this. What, what does this do for us to achieve our climate goals? Certainly having the ability for active transportation, um, you know, from a transportation per perspective and, and having people have choices as it relates to transit, cycling, or zero emission vehicles are, are certainly where we can see some of our bigger wins. Okay. So it will significantly negatively impact it. Fair enough. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the questions. Oh, questions. Sorry. Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Councilor, uh, Principal, haven't had a chance to ask questions, so are you asking questions, Councilor Principal? Yes, yeah, I do have a question. It, it is um, in relation to climate action. Where do we see a greater impact in climate action? Would it be uh, on, in the active transportation implementation, or would it be more so from uh, the buildings, uh, retrofitting buildings? I'll maybe look to the team to complement this, but I think it's both. Um, certainly from a transportation perspective, as I, I noted, uh, transit, cycling, uh, and zero emission vehicles are, are one of the big wins. And certainly on the building side, um, uh, density and, and people in proximity to, to transit and active transportation modes is important. Right, so taking um, uh, bike lanes specifically and the usage of them, which would be a greater impact? 
Kent, do you have? So, sure. Yeah, uh, I think, Councillor, you're looking to see. So transportation in our community emissions represents about 30% of our total emissions. So it is significant. Buildings in our community represent about 40. So both of those combinations of buildings and how we get around the city, that's, that's really where the emissions are. Um, so any action to reduce in those categories are, are our big wins. Um, part of the, the goal is to get a mode, mode split as well, to get more people into public transit if that works for them, into bike lanes or walking, living so that they can walk, um, or into zero emission vehicles. So each of those segments would have um, different <clears throat> um, values associated, and it's all around mode shift. And we know that 70 plus percent of Edmontonians get around by personal vehicle currently today. So bike lanes are a smaller proportion, but as our city form changes and we become more compact, we anticipate that bike lanes will become a much more important way to get around our city. Okay, uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor uh, uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And not to relitigate an entire debate we had a year ago, but uh, just a quick question. Um, what have we seen in cities that have built out their bike lanes? Do they get uh, an increase in, in bike users from the general population? Uh, Councillor Paquette, absolutely. That is um, a pretty tried and true um, process. If you build that infrastructure and that network, but it has to be to a certain threshold so that folks can move around the community, we do see cycling increase in communities. Right, like interconnected, because if you just have little spots, it doesn't get any, anyone where they want to go. Is that, that what is I'm hearing? Correct. The network um, is very important. Can't have a road, for instance, if you're taking a vehicle that doesn't get you to where you need to go. All right. And do we have an idea of the cost savings of uh, that we get in like to the city from bike infrastructure versus other modes of transportation? In terms of the footprint that that infrastructure and asset ma maintenance would um, comprise, is that the question? Yeah. So, for example, if someone drives uh, in a car, it might cost us, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, $8 uh, per user per year. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure I've got that. I don't have that information right in front of me, but um, I in wonder terms if it's of... Auckland has that information. I don't, okay. I don't have specifics, Councillor Paget. I can just do, use metrics of, if you consider the degree of asphalt required for a three meter um, active transportation system versus the comparator four lanes of arterial road, it's quite significant in terms of the life cycle cost requirements. Right, so the, the less wear and tear of people choosing a different mobility helps on the infrastructure of car lane, but also the bike lane requires less infrastructure maintenance. Correct. Well. So overall, we can see a net savings to the city. Yeah, and I think it's also helping with growth. So um, as you provide active transportation infrastructure, you're providing choices for people in terms of how we grow from from where we are today to 1.25 to 1.5 to 1.75 to 2 million. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Cardwell. Thank you. Have we, do we have a set of projects that are now in progress from this bundle from last year? No, that's uh, so what I mentioned at budget and, and, and just recently here was 2023 was developing the plan for implementation. Implementation will happen over 24, 25, and 26. Okay, so we don't have a, a set of discrete projects yet. Not related to this composite, but to Councillor Principe's earlier question, through different yeah. capital programs, we have improvements to the active transportation infrastructure that support council approved um, network plan that has, that has guided us. Yeah, other projects have bike plan components in them. Active transportation components. Active, tra yeah, fine. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have a including Twilliger. Yeah. We have a jar. Oh, do you? Yes. Oh well, it's 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 active transportation. Well, I could fill up your jar, I'm sure, because um, I. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, 
do we have areas that we're targeting? Like, are, I, I think we're sort of targeting missing links, or are there geographical parts of the city that we're targeting? Or we are, to, to Ken's comment, we yeah. are targeting as much as possible to complete the network to provide continuity. Um, um, right. And yeah. based on the overlay of the council approved uh, network plan. From core out or from? Uh, no, it's actually, um, I, I hesitate to call it missing links because some of them are quite significant in terms of, yeah. of connecting the dots, but it's throughout the city. Okay, and I'm sorry I missed this. What were the what were the um, debt servicing amounts that would be saved? You just had them. I'm sorry. I was. Do you want the the tax levy impacts or the dollar values? It's 120, dollar values. 123, 176, and 1.9. 123, 176. Or sorry, 776. Yes, 123 in 2024, uh, 776,000 in 2025, and like Jody said, 1.9 in 2026. 26. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, so the first question, and because this approach three and the total budget based on the uh, information city administration provided is $200 million, right? So last year for the budget deliberation, we only uh, budgeted a half for $100 million. Yeah, there was three different options provided where council landed was an accelerated program with a value of $100 million. Uh, so if reduced by 50 um, for the $100 million project, let me ask this way, and how much progress we already made, how much money we already spent it, and then out of the $100 million we budgeted last year. So our, uh, you know, I'll have to dig up our actual expenditures, but again, we've been proceeding on the basis of what we shared with council around acceleration was to plan in 2023 and build in 24, 25, and 26. Um, and I'm just pausing here to see if folks are chatting me what we've spent to date. Um, but we can certainly dig that up. Um, um, so that, that was our approach, just waiting to get the details on what we spent in 2023. So with this reduction and to half, um, the progress is still, so we still have that 50, 50 million dollars budget and to make some progress. So is yes, uh, to Councillor Tang's earlier point, we'd have to do some rework uh, because we've developed an implementation plan based on priorities of actioning a hundred million dollars worth of infrastructure versus if 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 this passes, it would be fifty. So we'd have to we'd have to make some different uh, choices about what are the priorities and and I think some of the other advice we provided during budget was that if if you get too low then you miss that opportunity to create that connectivity that we're trying to create in the network uh, and we've spent about two million dollars preparing for this two million dollars spending okay so um, is that fair to say uh, if this past reduction passed and then the scope and the schedule for the project will be changed uh, we'll be will be stretched to um, I, I think implement in, in the accelerated fashion that that uh, was approved by council um, for the twenty three to twenty six budget because we'd have to revisit the priorities. Um, is that is the option available and from other active uh, transportation funding and we already approved and to move around to support the certain project progress? Well, we, we look at it going back to Ken's comments and Kim's comments related to um, implementation of city plan, um, that the necessary active transportation improvements as part of other projects are still necessary. And so we wouldn't make any adjustments because you'd miss an opportunity to address those uh, active transportation needs as part of other projects. Uh, because w what I heard, because we have many, many uh, uh, different active uh, transportation project for the bike line, this one piece is actually embedded to the different projects and for active transportation. So we don't know right now um, the different pro active transportation projects 
their scope will cover some of this or not? Do we know that? No, the 100 million was specifically for um, what I described as um, areas that, that are missing in terms of that complete network where we undertake, for example, a, a neighborhood renewal. Um, that's in addition to the, the priorities identified for the 100 million. Uh, we wouldn't make adjustments, recommend making adjustments to neighborhood renewal to reallocate, uh, for example, because that's necessary infrastructure in the end anyways. Okay, thank, thank, thank you for the answer. All right, so that concludes the questions now to uh, this, and uh, I think we can, uh, I don't, I'll ask how many people are to speak to this. If too many are speaking, then we will end here. If only few are speaking, we can extend the order to finish this. I I'll don't move see to extend order to finish okay. this item. Second. Second. Please vote. Just this one. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, Councillor Principe, to close. Oh, okay. No one's going to speak. To I did. did no one okay, has shown great. any. Interest. Okay, so I would just like to. Um, reiterate what I had said in my opening. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is to try to, I just noticed that our debt repayment is increasing significantly year over year and I find that concerning and I was looking for a way to try to um, at least somehow manage that even even if it isn't a significant change, it is it is a way to um, decrease the debt repayment which is one of our largest expenses. Uh, so, and when I heard that over the 25 years we would actually be spending 195 million on it, I thought it would be, um, and, and knowing that this will be implemented anyways because of council direction, just would be on a shorter timeline, I thought this was, would be uh, an appropriate way to try to, to rein in the debt repayment. And this is why I brought this forward. Thank you. Thank you. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That has failed. And Councillor Tang, we have some housekeeping to do. Sure. Uh, so Mayor Sohi, uh, I, Council could consider moving. Oh wait, sorry. Just kidding. I would like to move. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to move that Council waive the rules on providing notice of motion, as set out in Section. Wait. I can move that. Okay. Yeah. On Section 32 of Bylaw 1A155, Council Procedures Bylaw to allow Councillor Stevenson to make a motion without customary notice regarding adjustments to orders of the day for Community and Public Services Committee, Urban Planning Committee, and City Council public hearing. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And thank you. I'll move that the orders of the day for the following meetings be changed. December 4th, 2023, Community and Public Services Committee um, uh, have a dinner break from 5 to 6 p.m. and adjourn at 9 p.m. On December 5th, 2023, Urban Planning Committee um, have dinner from 5 to 6 p.m. with adjournment at 9 p.m. And December 11th, City Council Public Hearing, dinner 5 to 6 p.m. and adjournment at 9 p.m. Lots of late nights together. Second. 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 Councilor Principe? Okay, please vote. Go, 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 go. What? Do you want to have questions? I don't 
don't have, no, I just, this is the first time seeing my dates changes. Yeah. So I'm just trying to look at my calendar and, especially for the fifth. Can I just have a second? Okay. okay. Just waiting on one final vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, so we will resume back on uh, Monday. Right? Yep, and just a friendly reminder, clerks in the budget office are hosting sessions on amendment writing if anybody needs any extra support tomorrow. Can you repeat tomorrow what time? One in the morning and one in the afternoon. All the invites have been sent to your calendars Good. along with the templates and the how-to guide. Yeah, please utilize that opportunity. Okay. All right, we will be back on Monday. Until then, we are on the recess.